Picture this. You're the daughter of a duke who spent her whole life with the destiny of marrying the crown prince. One evening, your world crumbles as your engagement is annulled. You're abandoned by your family and forced to wander the streets until you disguise yourself as a man and enroll yourself into the knights. But unfortunately, you meet your end by the prince of an enemy nation. However, that was the sixth time you died. And returning to life for now the seventh time, you somehow find yourself getting proposed to by the very same prince who killed you. This is the exciting plot of Seventh Time Loop. The villainess enjoys a carefree life married to her worst enemy. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. On a night filled with rain and thunder, soldiers clash blades entangled in a war. A man in black seemingly unfazed strolls through slashing everyone in his path with ease. The knights in white shout amongst themselves that the princes they serve have yet to escape because they're too young to flee swiftly, but they must hold out until the bell signals their escape. The knights brace themselves as the cause of war, Emperor of Gaokine Kingdom, Arnold Hein, calmly approaches them. The knight with pink hair readies her blade, and the troops advance, attempting to strike the enemy emperor, but he dispatches the first few with very little effort. Then, as the pink and red-haired knight trade blows with the emperor, he finds an opening. However, the red-haired knight takes it on, hoping to help the female knight escape. She then attacks anyways, only to meet a similar fate with a sword impaling her directly, making this her end. But it's not truly over. As time begins to tick, and we see the prince named Dietrich announcing an end to his engagement with this pink-haired girl. Riche, the daughter of a duke, responds that she understands, which catches him off guard since, with their marriage being annulled, she should have nowhere else to go. She isn't worried in the slightest, which only shocks him further. She then takes her leave, and as the prince babbles that he's spent the whole week thinking about how he'd read off her list of crimes, she ignores this, thinking she'd been sent back in time again. She's experienced this all before, not once, not twice, but now for the seventh time she's relived her life. Even now, she remembers her very first life, where the prince had ended their engagement and exiled her from the kingdom with no real explanation. Her parents had abandoned her due to their oath of loyalty to the crown. Even though the accusations were completely false, she screamed and begged, but to no avail. She began wandering aimlessly until the Aria Trading Company of Merchants spotted her. Looking at her expensive silk and jewelry, the chief asked if she wanted a ride to the next town over. He could tell she was from a duke's house, and before he could finish, she offered to sell her ring to him. As they rode together, the chief explained his company doesn't just buy and sell things. They find goods that set their hearts ablaze and sell them to people who are just excited to buy from them, a company where both the buyer and seller love their wares. This makes Riche curious, and the chief could tell she was thinking, this sounds like a lot of fun. He then asks if she wants to take the path of a merchant, especially now that she's been freed of her stifling destiny of being married to the crown prince. She uttered the statement, free? To do what I want? Something the daughter of a duke could never fathom. The chief welcomed her with open arms, and Riche responded with excitement to join them. In her first life, she learned how to trade under Chief Tolly, and eventually set out on her own as a merchant where she traveled the world, pursuing her newfound dream of visiting every country. With only one country left, she got swept up in a war, and ended up losing her life. After her first death, she was surprised to see she returned exactly to the moment Prince Dietrich had ended their engagement. Thinking everything she had experienced might have been a dream, she pinched her cheeks, feeling real pain, which made the prince laugh. But all she could think about was how this wasn't a dream, and she needed to hurry to her mansion before she got locked out. She headed home and packed her bags, thinking if she had more stuff initially in her first life, she could have grown her enterprise more quickly. With her luggage, she headed to the same spot she had met Chief Tolly in the Aria Company, only to find out it was past the time they were supposed to arrive. She was too late, all because she had gone home to gather her things. She went through her stuff and found a book left by her grandmother containing pictures of foreign medicinal plants. At least this time, Riche had money. So in her second life, she sold all her possessions and traveled across the sea in order to study medicine. She gained knowledge of where medicinal plants grew and knew when epidemics would spread. She was able to put the experience she gained from her first life to good use. Riche eventually went to the kingdom in the north, where she had saved the sickly Prince Kyle. She found her life as an herbalist fulfilling and incredibly rewarding, but just like her first life, she was swept up in a war and died. In life number three, she quickly accepted and complied with Dietrich's proposal annulment. This time, she sought after Dr. Michael Evan, who was serving Prince Kyle during her second life. He expanded her knowledge on medicines, and eventually she parted ways with him to further her research. Until, once again, she got swept in a war and died. 
In Life 4, she served as a handmaid to a duke's household, and in Life 6, she disguised herself as a man and served as a knight. In all her lives, she found a sense of fulfillment and enjoyed herself. But no matter what, after five years in each life, she experienced death. Regardless of always dying from war, she spent her days so busy she nearly died from overworking. Leaving the hall where Dietrich rejected her, she felt in her now seventh life she just wants to take it easy this time. That way, she can live a long life. Just like how you'd live a better life by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. That way, I get to share more fun and interesting shoujo plots with you in anime, manga, and manhwa. I'd appreciate it. Usually, she leaves through the main entrance, but exiting the way she's going now will be quicker. However, this makes her bump into the man that killed her in her sixth life, the future Emperor of Galkine, Arnold Hein. She screams Emperor when she realizes who it is, but he's surprised that she knows his identity since it's his first time in the kingdom. She then politely introduces herself, making the excuse that his reputation precedes him. He then wonders why she calls him Emperor since right now he's just the crown prince. But with no way to explain, she just apologizes, saying she's flustered right now having been rejected by Prince Dietrich. She tells him she must hurry to get her belongings before she gets locked out of her house, and runs to the balcony where she takes off her shoes and jumps down to the ground. This leaves the prince surprised at the spectacle, watching her break her heels so she can walk more comfortably. He chuckles a little and tells his attendant Oliver to ready his horse, because he's going to go after Rishay. As Rishay wanders in the dark, she notices her body has too little endurance and thinks she'll have to train it all over again. She spots the townsfolk all gathered and when the knights see her, they tell Prince Dietrich she's arrived. Dietrich approaches in order to berate her, saying it's justice for him to judge her in front of his people. But she can't help but think this is one of the most annoying scenarios. If she arrived a little later, she could have avoided seeing Dietrich's stupid face again, but must now instead endure embarrassment. Prince Dietrich believes she must be in complete despair due to the annulled marriage. However, he couldn't be more wrong. She asks if he's stupid, given her unfazed demeanor. She explains she's not saddened at all, which causes the townsfolk to wonder if Rishay was actually the one who had ended the engagement, since the prince looks more hurt than she does. He shouts back at them for being disrespectful, which makes Rishay glad there wasn't a single timeline where she lived a married life with him. Rishé then scolds the prince, telling him he shouldn't speak like that since his job is to protect and cherish his people. But the prince tells her she should correct her demeanor and ask for forgiveness. Then she responds, Nah, I'm glad, which makes the knights laugh at the prince. Then, Lady Marie appears and tells Rishé to stop bullying her prince. This is when Dietrich accuses Rishé for bullying Marie and tells her he couldn't allow a twisted woman to become queen. Marie looks away, with both her and Rishé realizing the lies she's been telling. But Rishé is okay regardless. She tells the two she'll never appear before them again, and that ever since she was a child, she believed her marriage to the crown prince was all she was ever worth. She now understands she can find worth within herself, and doesn't require a dumb prince like Dietrich in her life, which causes him to get taken aback and to fall over. Riche then tells Marie that even though she's lied about everything, she doesn't resent Marie at all. She knows Marie is trying to marry the prince for her family's sake, but if she were to live a future that wasn't what she wished for, there'd be no point to it making Marie reflect a bit on Rishé's words. Rishé puts her hands on her chest, telling Marie she should be able to find both happiness for her family and herself at the same time. That way she can live a life where she's always smiling. Rishé then takes her leave, and as she walks away, a hand grabs her shoulder, causing her to reflexively draw a blade and clash with none other than Arnold Hine. He questions where she learned her sword skills from, but she refuses to answer, saying it's a secret. She then adds that her skills aren't worthy of praise, since Arnold was most likely holding back in his strike. Prince Dietrich tells him to get away from Rishé, but she tells everyone to stand still, as they are in the presence of the Crown Prince of Galkine. Everyone knows about the Beast Prince that single-handedly annihilated a troop of knights. She then asks why he's here, thinking that this same man will one day cause a war that envelops the entire world. A war that always seems to end her life. To her surprise, he gets on one knee, and as the moonlight shines on the two of them, he apologizes and proposes to Rishé for her hand in marriage. Rishé was unsure if she heard the prince correctly. Become his wife? After Prince Arnold reaffirms this, everyone else shockingly grasps at this surprising gesture. However, Rishé responds by declining, 
but what happens next she never would have expected. Arnold begins laughing as if he's really enjoying this. Dietrich shrieks at the idea of the crown prince of Gaokine proposing to the same woman he just annulled his engagement to. But all Riche could think of is the absurdity of getting proposed to by the man who had killed her in her sixth life. Dietrich's father arrives by carriage and slams him down immediately apologizing on behalf of his son for being rude to Arnold, and Arishe because his son was secretly seeing another woman. Arnold thinks nothing of it and promises this incident won't cause any discord between their two nations, but only if he's allowed private time with Rishe, to which he whispers that if she refuses, he'll move on to the next tactic. Across each other from a candlelit table, Rishe asks the prince what he's plotting. He responds, nothing, I've completely fallen in love with you, that's all, and this confuses Rishe. Arnold proclaims with her engagement broken, there's no one left to take her in, and she thinks he'd be right if this was her first life. But with it now being her seventh, she now knows life has infinite opportunities. In front sat the future savage emperor, the invader, and every life she's lived, he instigated a war. She wonders if she stays by his side, will she learn his reasons? To continue their marriage, she makes a few demands for him to follow. And of course, if it's within his power, he agrees to make her wishes come true. One. Riche wants everything for the wedding ceremony procured through the same trading company she worked with in her previous life. 2. After marriage, she wants her own space to receive guests from other countries. 3. She wants the two of them to live separately from the current emperor. And 4. The most important point she must absolutely have. To live lazily around the castle without obligations or any work at all. But even with all of this, the prince can't help but smile. And then she also requests that he doesn't touch her at all. Later, the two head out by carriage with Arnold glancing at her, but Riche only stares outside the window. They travel various parts, enjoying the scenery. Riche even gets to enjoy some flower picking. As they continue the ride, Riche draws her blade from her sleep, questioning why the prince is approaching her when she told him not to touch her. He was just trying to take back his sword that she seemed to sleep so comfortably with. Riche then shrieked, apologizing for her rudeness, but Arnold was surprised she could sleep slumped over a sword for support. However, Riche was thinking of the embarrassment of sleeping on the same sword that impaled her. Arnold remarks on how incredible it is she could react to him without even his touch, and that she must have trained very hard, causing Riche to sweat but simply reply, uh, yes, she did. The prince then announces that he made contact with the Arya Trading Company so that they could supply all of their wedding materials. He asks Riche if she's purchased with them before, and she responds that she hasn't, but as a company, they're gaining popularity and she wanted to try them out, while secretly thinking of her old friends that had worked there from her previous lives. She then shudders, looking at the prince directly. She never realized how handsome he was. Seeing her in a daze, Arnold asks what's wrong, but as Riche is about to say it's nothing, the carriage stops with enemies attacking outside. Prince Arnold walks out and tells Riche to stay safe inside the carriage, but she can't help but think he has no reason to fight himself if his knights are going to fight for him. She desires to help, so she pulls out a hairpin and unlocks the door, only to step out and witness Arnold slaying the last bandit. Arnold kicks the bandit over, remarking how much of a shame it is he stepped out, as none of them were enough to satiate his boredom, making Riche a little nervous witnessing his brutal behavior. But even more surprising, none of the bandits were actually slain at all, simply arrested and detained without any fatal casualties. With the red-haired knight named Camille taking more serious wounds, Riche rushes over to him. The knight explains his body feels numb, so Riche picks up one of the bandits' daggers and sees it drenched in poison. Prince Arnold comes over to him to tell them to tie the spot between the wound and Camille's heart and then to suck the poison out from him. Riche stares at the blade further, noticing the smell to be familiar from her time working at an apothecary. As the prince talks with his attendant, we learn it'll take two days for them to reach Gaokine, where the knights can receive proper medical treatment. However, Riche lets them know that she can just craft the antidote herself. She begins grinding up some ingredients she had collected and makes a concoction for the knights. When she presents it, everyone from the crew stares at her with confusion, and she can't help but wonder if they're all suspicious of how she knew how to make such a thing. So to ease their suspicion, she cuts herself with the poisonous blade, causing the prince to react and come to her side with fear. But she reassures them by spreading the antidote on the wound she made. As the knights receive treatment, Arnold's attendant, Oliver can't help but wonder, with the prince being way stronger than all of them, why does he keep guards around? Arnold explains he would rather keep his knights close to avoid them dying off in some unknown battlefield he isn't a part of, as he believes this is for his nation's best interest. The prince then heads over to Riche, who is picking flowers once again, 
remarking his surprise at how the flowers she'd been picking weren't just for her own enjoyment. He sits down to ask how she got out of the carriage, but she replies, it's a secret. Thinking of the time when she lived as a maid, the woman she had served often locked herself in a room, so Rishi learned the lockpick to serve her master better. As Rishi continues to pick the flowers, she notices the prince gazing at her and asks him if something was on his mind. He replies, nothing in particular, just that he was thinking she is unfathomable and wonders what action she could take next to entertain him as he's full of anticipation. Rishi feels like he thinks of her as some kind of wild beast and tells him she's not doing any of this for his amusement. The prince elaborates he understands and explains his favorite knight, Camille, had once lived in the slums. The kingdom of Galkine extols itself proudly as a meritocracy, which is a government that selects people based on their abilities. But there are still many within the kingdom who are unfairly judged due to their upbringing. Arnold greatly respected Camille because he never let others get to him and worked hard to become a knight. Then he spoke of another knight who suffered the worst of the poisons and is completely new to the job. But this new knight also worked himself day and night for the sake of escorting the prince and his new fiancée. Rishi is impressed that Arnold knows so much about his knights, but none of this is a surprise to him since he's chosen all of them personally as his retainers, causing Rishi to blush a little at how thoughtful he really is. The next thing he does really throws her off. He thanks Rishi for saving his knights, causing her to flash back to when he was the vicious emperor who burned everything in his path, making her believe she couldn't comprehend the prince in front of her to be the same man. Could this all be a ruse? She then says, it was nothing, and plays off her herbalism skill set as something she just happened to know. She then asks why the knights were so wary of her. So Arnold explains that they had heard she was a lady who had her engagement broken off recently and wondered if their prince was marrying some kind of villainous with all sorts of schemes. She acknowledges that would make sense and then asks what the current emperor, Arnold's father, had heard of her. Arnold had only told him that she's from a ducal house with connections to the royal family and previously a fiancé to the crown prince, and that because he had fancied her, Arnold stole her away. Arnold then says, because Rishi is from a foreign country, many people from Gaokine may be rude to her, but she's happy about this because it probably gives others the impression that she's a hostage and more of a reason she might not have to do any official duties, furthering her chances of being able to laze around. They then arrive at the Gaokine kingdom, which is rich in fertile land and abundant resources a kingdom that influences every nation in the world. In all of Rishi's previous lives, it's the one place she never visited. She smiles, witnessing the imperial capital, and all the subjects gather as the carriage makes its way through, and they celebrate the return of their beloved prince. They then arrive at the Grand Imperial Villa. The prince tells Rishi preparations are still happening, so she must stay in the guest housing at the moment. It apparently hasn't been used for a long time, so it's a little messy. But Rishi is fine because she's quote-unquote a hostage, causing Arnold to wonder why she seems so proud of that term. The guest villa is quite dusty, but the inner maid in Rishi makes her excited to clean up. However, Camille and another knight offer their assistance as well. She tells them it won't be needed. She begins dusting and cleaning her new place, while thinking in a few years, Arnold will kill his father and take over as emperor. Thus, she tactically planned to make sure the two of them would live away from the current emperor, to hopefully prevent the war from happening since it always involved Arnold starting it in some way. She's opposed to war because she is adamant to spend a long life lazing around comfortably without care. She then spots some maids bullying a new one. The red-haired maid pulls the curtains from the new maid and announces the three of them will be chosen to be their highnesses and Crown Prince Arnold's maids. Rishi rushes to the fallen maid to check on her. Then, the red-haired maid, thinking Rishi is also a new maid due to her dirty hands and cleaning outfit, tells her unfortunately she and her posse with three years of experience are the only ones capable of working in the palace. However, Rishi just ignores their remarks completely and tells them those curtains shouldn't be washed outside because the type of clouds and the birds flying low are a sign of there to be rain soon. The maids don't believe her and walk away saying there's no way there's going to be rain with the nice weather. Then Rishi asks if the new maid is okay. The new maid, Elsie, thanks her and looks down at her outfit and we see it's gotten dirty from her fall. She's saddened by it, but Rishi tells her it'll be fine if they wash it right away. Rishi did say it would rain soon, but the maid apron fabric will dry quickly. And then she explains they need to use this brush to wash the dirt out. Elsie asks who Rishi is, but she plays it off to not give her status away too quickly. Later in the evening, after the rain, Rishi stares out her balcony, reminiscing the times where she had desired to travel all over the world as a merchant. Now having done it all, 
she is happy to finally see the one place she hasn't visited. She senses the prince and asks him if it's okay that he's skipping out on his royal duties, and he's surprised that she perceived him sneaking in. He asks her what she was looking at. She's apparently curious about some of the buildings around the city. So Prince Arnold describes the library containing books from all the countries around the world, and the church that serves as a clock tower that tolls at appointed times. Riche then points at the marketplace, excited to visit it soon, but then stops to ask why Arnold is staring at her. He had been wondering what she found so entertaining, since she was pressured into a marriage with the crown prince and taken far away to another country. She then tells him she's wanted to come to this country for a very long time, and that the final push that made her agree to the marriage might have been the admiration she's always felt for the country of Gaokine. He doesn't think there's anything special about it, but she disagrees, saying there's so many fascinating places here, and that the faces of the people in town shine so brightly. But then she stops with the prince staring at her, making her wonder if she said something weird. So he answers, he's never seen anyone like her before. The way her words carry substance, her knowledge, her physical ability. There's no way a simple nobleman's daughter could have such things. This makes her think back to when her mother had said that being in a duke's family, Riche's personal feelings were unnecessary, and that her happiness lied in marrying into the royal family and bearing an heir. But Riche's heart always yearned to learn things. However, all Riche's mother wanted was for her to maintain appearances in social situations, to focus on homemaking, not academic study. Riche tells the prince even if others deemed what she's learned to be unnecessary, she treasures every bit of it. What she's learned are riches that can't be lost, and precious to her being. She will decide for herself what she finds valuable. The prince acknowledges this, causing her to grow wide-eyed. He touches her cheek, and looking her in the eyes, tells her she should do whatever she wishes without constraints, and promises to support her with anything as a sign of his love and devotion. She asks why, and he responds like he said earlier, he's fallen completely in love with her. But she thinks he must be lying. He then tells her whatever she treasures, he doesn't think of as pointless, but instead finding those things to be delightful from the bottom of his heart, which catches her off guard. As he walks away, he tells her to think of something she wants, since he broke his agreement not to touch her. Afterwards, she gets taken aback, thinking she can't read him at all, and wonders what he could be plotting. The next morning, Riche awakens and stretches to the morning light, brushing off yesterday's incident with Prince Arnold. She's startled to hear the voice of Oliver calling for her, so she quickly gets dressed and meets him at the door, panting a little out of breath. This is the only time it seems he can get out of the office, as everything is busy attending to the needs of the Gaokine kingdom. However, he's not as busy as Prince Arnold, who hasn't even been able to get a nap in. Because he's been trying to complete all the work that's been piling up from his visit in Riche's home kingdom of Hermity, Riche feels bad, but Oliver says there's no need to. The prince originally had no intentions to marry anyone, and he's happy to see Arnold has finally chosen a wife for himself. Riche then holds her arms out and tells Oliver he can look at her all he likes, since it seems he's been examining her this entire time. But he apologizes since it's kind of rude to do, and is surprised that Riche is as keen as the prince had said. However, Riche commends him for loyally serving the prince. Upon finding out that Oliver has been serving the prince for over 10 years, she figures he must know Arnold best. So she asks Oliver why the prince has chosen her to be his wife, but she wasn't expecting Oliver to be surprised as well. He's never seen the prince so happy, never seen him smile so open and honestly, except around Riche. Only, she feels like she's being treated as some sort of toy. Oliver laughs, causing Riche to think there's no denial of her statement. Getting to what he came for, Oliver presents the list of honored guests for the wedding ceremony. Various important names, such as Princess Harriet of Sigil, Duke Jonal representing the Kingdom of Domana, Prince Kao of Coyoles, and then Oliver presents the list of attendees for tomorrow's party, an event that Riche was completely unaware of. Tomorrow evening comes. Many carriages arrive at the Gaokine Kingdom estate, the finest food prepared by the chefs. We see the prince handling his paperwork until he hears a knock on the door from Riche, who is asking if he's free. When she enters, the prince is taken aback a little, seeing his beautiful wife-to-be. However, Riche is here to collect on Arnold's promise to give her something for touching her earlier on the balcony. She wants to be the one to select her maids. Arnold is fine with this, but he sighs, realizing Oliver didn't tell her the purpose of tonight's party. It's a formal event arranged by the Emperor 
Emperor with the purpose of finding a wife for Crown Prince Arnold. A pointless pretense held to keep up appearances. However, Riche is fine with this, feeling no dishonor even being the quote-unquote hostage Crown Princess. She then gives him her hand, saying it's perfectly fine to reveal her as his official fiancé. He sighs happily, relieved to break the news to the entire kingdom, especially since he's now gotten permission to touch his lovely wife-to-be. The humongous door is open, with Riche and Arnold making their way. We see the grand ballroom filled to the brim with guests of various high-class estates. As they walk down the stairs, Riche remarks on how the whole shindig is much grander than she anticipated, but Arnold says it's still on the smaller side, making Riche sweat a little over the differences in coming to a larger country. Once the two of them make it to the ballroom floor, some dukes greet them. One of the dukes wants Arnold to share the remarkable stories of his travels to another country with his daughter. However, Arnold says there's nothing really noteworthy he saw out there, but he did get lucky finding Riche to be his wife, and everyone in the ballroom gasps as they see their high is smiling, something this guy never does. Some of the girls speaking in hushed whispers that he's never even glanced in their direction. But hey, it's probably because most of them are mid with unnoteworthy personalities. Riche can tell many of the people here are experiencing curiosity, jealousy, and ulterior motives, but compared to having her engagement broken in front of everyone, this truly feels like nothing at all. She graciously bows while introducing herself, and everyone stares in awe at the beauty of her courtesy. Arnold smiles and tells everyone that since his future wife has just arrived from another country, she has no one to rely on, so he'd like them all to accommodate her nicely. As the two walk through the crowd, Riche whispers that there's no need to provoke the other ladies by calling her his future wife, but he replies it's better to be as apparent as they can. She asks, be apparent about what? And he responds, the fact that I will protect you no matter what happens. This makes Riche frantic inside protect her? Did he really just say he'd protect her? The very same man who killed her? She quickly turns and says he's the one who's probably the most dangerous to her, especially because she can't match him in swordplay. To quell her fears, he offers himself as a partner for sword sparring when they're free which gets Riche really excited knowing she could receive sword training from the beastly prince. Arnold happily responds that she always replies in ways that exceed his expectations, all while she's thinking she can learn the attack method behind Arnold's fearsome sword techniques. With the ballroom's music startling Riche, Prince Arnold tells her that there's no need to force herself to dance. But since she's here anyways, she also wants to enjoy herself. The two join hands and Arnold pulls her in as they dance to the music. The people stare as they both lock eyes, with Riche face to face with Arnold. She thinks back to the moment where he killed her and decides she wants to get a little payback. She tries to take the lead in their dance multiple times, but the prince counters as if to say no matter what she does, it's no use. He proves himself to be a skillful dancer as he gets close without ever crossing her space, showing that he's able to present the beauty of their dancing without any strain. However, she does feel something odd. Is there weakness in his left shoulder? It's something she felt even on the fateful day as they had dueled to the death. As their dance continues, the prince Prince pulls her arm up, causing Riche to think she's going to fall. But there's nothing to fear as he gracefully dips Riche, and everyone applauds them for their fine performance. Afterwards, one of the guests comes over to compliment Riche and to offer her some wine. As Riche accepts the drink and smells it, she intakes an aroma of crushed red peppers. It's become quickly apparent that these girls are pranksters who are jealous of her engagement to the prince. Riche brings up that this wine seems to have an interesting aroma, which makes the girl who brought it play dumb, as if she has no idea what she's doing. However, Riche just smiles and drinks, confirming to them it has a very stimulating flavor and it makes her happy to have been welcomed this way, causing all the girls to stare back at her with mouths agape. The main girl gets frustrated with her pranks foiled, and she tells her posse they're leaving without ever responding to Riche's remarks at all. Outside, Riche continues to drink the spicy drink. Then Arnold appears, asking about it. After he becomes aware of what had happened, he becomes a little pissed and tells her she should just throw it away. Riche refuses since the wine lost its chance to be enjoyed for its natural flavor, thinking the least she could do is drink it so it doesn't go to waste. So the prince responds by taking the drink and swallowing it all, and asks her if her duty to the wine has now been fulfilled. Sweating in nervousness, she replies, yes, and thanks him for respecting her intent. The prince then walks aside her, and we learn he's really out here to question why she was lost in thought thinking of someone else other than him. 
but she couldn't possibly say she was thinking about him from the future. She puts the glass aside and tells Arnold she's worried about him. She points to her left collarbone area and asks if that's where he's been wounded, making the prince become wide-eyed. The movement of his left shoulder is slightly clumsier than his right, even back then when they had fought. When he opens his clothing, she stares in shock. It's an old wound with a particular spot that slightly constricts his skin. She stares in horror and goes to touch the very old scar. She can tell he must have been struck with a blade over and over with killing intent. He then explains only a few people know about this scar, but no one has ever guessed about its existence. But when she asks why he has it, he just ignores her question, saying the night wind has grown colder as an excuse so he can head inside, leaving her with many questions as a mysterious onlooker smirks having heard them from below. The next day, we see the maids clean as they wonder who is going to be chosen as the crown princess's handmaidens. Diana then walks out to them, asking if the group has finished their cleaning yet. But upon learning they have not, she also scolds them for not being able to fold the sheets the same way she had taught. However, Riche still not having revealed that she's actually the princess, decides to help with the folding herself. The trio of skilled maids then berates the washing maids a bit more, and then the three of them head out. As Riche continues to clean, she gets an apology from Elsie because all of them are so bad at remembering things. But Riche tells her it's okay, because all of them haven't been here very long, and no one gets everything right in the beginning. However, in reality, Riche knows it isn't because Elsie and the others are bad at doing laundry. All the new maids are completing their work, it's just taking a little longer, and the long time for completion is something Diana's right about. Riche then decides to ask about Diana's background, and we learn from Elsie that she's from a wealthy family that owns several shops. Then the second maid, Nicole, adds that Diana's family had lost it all and went into debt. The following day, all the maids are lined up to hear who is being chosen as the princess's handmaidens. Diana wonders how this guest villa is so clean, considering no one had been here in a while. But of course, this was something Rishi had taken care of back when she first arrived. Everyone is eagerly anticipating what the crown princess looks like. Oliver then announces Lady Rishi's arrival, and as she slowly walks in, all the maids' jaws drop, learning the girl they had been working with was also the crown princess. Riche smiles a little embarrassed because she hid the truth of her identity to learn how all of them acted in their natural state of work. She thought it was best to speak to them earlier as a fellow maid would. She then read off the names of several maids, including Elsie and Nicole to be chosen as her personal handmaidens, with none of the experienced trio being included in the list. With Oliver about to speak, Diana cuts him off, asking why Riche had only chosen the new maids. Oliver tells her she's being disrespectful, but Riche says it's alright. She lets Diana go on about her experience as a maid, but then tells her she's fired, causing her to fall to her knees. Riche then asks about when Diana had first come to the palace, was she able to complete her work as efficiently as she does now? Diana says no, of course, as things were difficult in the beginning. She couldn't remember things after only being told once, but everyone was so busy. They would often tell her they didn't have the time to teach, so she better watch and remember. But even so, she'd grown to be more competent than all these new girls. Riche responds that she's right, but also Diana is very different from all the maids around her because she can also read and write. Being born into a merchant's family, she received a good education, which is something very few commoner families would have gotten. Diana could write down instructions from more tenured maids and read them again later. So it begs the question, what if Diana hadn't been able to read and write properly as well? Which causes her to gasp and reflect on all the times she treated the newer maids the same way she'd been treated, scolding them to be good despite knowing she'd only shown them how to do things one time. Diana sat depressed, explaining when her family went bankrupt, she lost everything. There was no one left to protect her, and even so, she made herself into a lady's maid, wondering why everyone else couldn't keep up with her, now realizing it's because she didn't teach them properly. With tears in her eyes, she apologized because she had been in the wrong the entire time. This caused Elsie and Nicole to come to her side and beg Riche not to fire her. Because Diana is very skilled and always tries her hardest, Diana thanks them, but she's willing to accept her fate. Riche then walks over and kneels on the ground to their level, causing everyone to gasp. She then tells Diana she'd like to make this villa a training ground for new maids, one where they not only learn household skills, but also learn to read and write. That way, wherever they go, they'll have the skills to take care of themselves, and she'd personally like Diana to become the head maid of teaching here. Diana is astonished, despite all the disrespect she dished out to them, but Riche thinks nothing of it, especially with Diana realizing the error of her ways. Then, back in Arnold's office, Oliver gives his report on what Rishi had done to the maid, but Arnold already 
already knew that Rishay would cause some kind of havoc, the both of them were quite amused with her actions, and Oliver remarked that he wonders what sorts of things she'll accomplish for their country. Arnold simply replies that he didn't get engaged to Rishay to benefit the Imperial family or the nation, but because he fell in love and wanted to give his beloved whatever she desired. We then turn back to Rishé, who is reading the made teaching materials that were created by Diana. Rishé hands them back to her, quite pleased with what she's presented. And Diana is overjoyed at all the fun she's having, thinking of all the best ways to teach everyone. Elsie then appears, telling Rishé it's time to be ready, since her guest is coming soon. And as Diana begins her leave, we see the relationship has improved between her and the new handmaiden, Elsie. Elsie dresses Rishé and prepares her hair in the best way to complement the outfit. Rishé had chosen her best outfit out of respect to meet with the merchant who had taught her everything in the very beginning of her first life. The man she sits across from being none other than Kane Tolley, the boss of the Arya Trading Company. The man before her introduces himself as Kane Tolley, the chief of the Arya Trading Company. And even though to him they're meeting for the first time, to Rishé, he is the man who taught her everything about being a merchant six lives ago. And even now, he's just as impressive as ever. Even making eye contact, she feels as if Kane can see right through her. However, since she does already know him, Rishé is confident that she has the upper hand. After all, in order to avoid war and live a long life, she needs his help. She reminds him that Prince Arnold is ordering all their wedding materials to be ordered through the Arya Trading Company. And even though Kane is grateful to both her and the prince, when she asks to see some of Kane's wares, he tells her he doesn't have a single item he'd sell to her. She stares, a little flabbergasted at his statement, but Kane tries to clear this as a misunderstanding. He tells her he doesn't have a single item that would match up to her expectations. She can't simply just be a customer of theirs, and she still wonders what he means by this. Kane senses that for some reason, he feels Rishé is staking her life on the two of them doing business together. Even with all the people he's ever met in his life, he's never met anyone with a strong resolve as the woman before him. He tells her once again he'll decline doing business with her. Even though Rishé tries to stop him just to speak a little longer, he says his goodbyes. Later, as Rishé decides to work on one of her gardens, she thinks back to when Kane had told her to become a merchant who can pick her customers, and that she needs to offer wares or other value that those customers can only get through her. Kane's philosophy is that he chooses his customers, but sadly, Rishé couldn't make Kane choose her. But she knows she'll need his connections for when the Arya Trading Company becomes the largest in the entire world. One of the knights assigned, Camille, asks Rishé why she's working on a garden since she's a crown princess. She responds that since the prince gave her this land, she felt like growing medicinal herbs. That way, she'd be able to make all sorts of medicines, leaving the two knights flabbergasted seeing her to do work that's unbefitting of conventional royalty. Rishé goes back to contemplating her interaction with Kane. Was he just being cautious of her? He's a careful man, but he also loves an all-or-nothing gamble. What could she have missed? This is when she flashes back to him saying, we're thinking of forgetting our work for a while and spending a few days enjoying the sights. And it hits her. She decides to end her gardening session and go rest in her room. Later that night, we see one of Kane's employees asking why he turned down Galkine's crown princess. Kane just laughs and replies, if they did accept her on, they'd see heavy losses. But upon entering where their company was staying, the two are welcomed by Rishé in disguise, who had just finished beating all the other Arya employees in a drinking game. Kane is astonished to find Rishé had beaten all his men. He then tells her her hair dye is quite pretty and asks how she came about it. Rishé knows her pink hair tends to stand out a bit, so she had to pick a more plain color. She tries to offer her secrets for making hair dye for the chance to do business with his company. Company. But he laughs, saying, of course not, as he knows she's brought something far more lucrative. Rishé sweats a bit, with Kane having caught on to her again. The negotiations begin. Kane just openly tells her he wants her to stop with all the I want to dress for my wedding charade, and Rishé accepts knowing the obvious tricks won't work on him. He's happy with this and tells her something has been on his mind since their first interaction. That Rishé shouldn't just be a client, but a trading partner with him instead. But he doesn't want to help anyone with any plans if he doesn't know the full scope of them. However, he is quite dedicated. He promises greater profit margins than she's ever imagined, as he asks her to spill every last detail of this money-making scheme of hers. But she can't tell him. Even so, still wanting the Arya Trading Company as her ally. Kane tells her it's interesting how she wants him to enter a contract without being told anything, even though it isn't even certain that he'll profit from it. 
This is the type of deal traders hate the most. However, she tells him she'll prepare compensation, but this only makes Kane reply sarcastically saying, you're telling me to trust you when you say I'll make a profit? A fine idea. But Riche knows within the next few years, the crown prince of this nation will wage war on other countries. She's formulating a plan to stop him, but that's not something she can tell Kane yet. Kane becomes a little impatient with her, but as he's about to tell her, the most important thing to him is results and proof of performance. She actually finishes his famous model Model, something he wasn't expecting to hear. She then tells him she'll think of a business that'll prove successful here in the capital, and that if he deems her trustworthy because of it, that he can reevaluate his decision at that time. The room goes silent for a second. Then Kane bursts out laughing. He enjoys the idea of her earning his acknowledgement by coming up with a profitable idea. Riche knew he'd enjoy the idea of a gamble. He then gives Riche a week to show him her resolve. With the battle on, Riche leaves Kane with the medicine for his employees to take for their hangover. Kane has no idea what it is, as he's never heard of any medicine like that before, but Riche assures him he'll understand once he uses it. She then makes it back to her balcony after sneaking out all night. However, when she enters, she begins to sweat. Hearing the voice of her prince saying, you were out late, she asks him why he's here, and Arnold explains he heard the Arya trading company turned her down. It felt strange. Why would a simple trader reject the request from a future crown princess? Since Arnold was the one who suggested Riche spend her time however she likes, he finds it unreasonable to criticize her actions. He then gets up and slowly walks towards her, making her move back, such that her back presses against the door. She then gets wide-eyed as Arnold puts his hand against the door. He's surprised that even she could look so scared when facing a man alone at night, even though she had never shown much fear before. Riche then apologizes since sneaking out of the villa alone at night is unbecoming of her position as his fiance. She doesn't mean to damage his reputation, but Arnold doesn't care about that at all. He was actually worried about her getting hurt, something that Riche wasn't expecting. He then tells her whenever she visits town, he'll go with her, which throws her off again. As he walks away, reminding her she's free to do as she wishes, she says she couldn't possibly ask him to go along with her selfish behavior. However, even though Arnold told her she's free to do what she likes, that didn't give her permission to freely put herself in danger, which actually gets Riche to blush with her prince indulging in her so much. But he understands that even if he did try to restrict her, she'd just slip out quietly anyways, as he comments on her dyed hair disguise. He feels it's just better to give her permission and go along with her, and when he laughs, Riche can tell he really seems to be enjoying himself. Arnold then asks what happened between her and the Aria Trading Company. However, she just responds by asking if he's hungry. He sits and watches her as she prepares some soup. She tastes it and gasps. She then turns to look at Arnold and apologizes because she's a terrible cook. However, Arnold is fine with it since it's more unusual to find a noble lady with cooking experience. He begins to sweat, remembering in her past lives, meals were just a time when she prioritized putting food in her stomach. Arnold then stands up and begins drinking the soup Riche prepared. He tells her it's good, causing her to gasp, making her think he can't tell between good and bad flavors. But he can tell she's probably thinking something disrespectful. After the two enjoy dinner, Riche explains her gamble with Kane Tolly. Arnold just simply replies that he understands. He then asks what business she plans to make. And even though Riche has a lot of ideas, she doesn't know what'll land, since she doesn't know what kind of things people here in the capital like. The prince just smiles at her, which makes Riche a little mad, since she can tell he's enjoying himself again. Arnold then gets up because he has to get back to work, but as he leaves, he tells Riche that if she's approached by his younger brother, not to entertain him or listen to his ideas at all. She then asks if there's something she should know, but he leaves without elaborating anything. In her library, Riche reads about the capital's basic demographics, such as male to female ratio, population age, and changes in economic development. She gardens in the morning, checks the maid's teaching materials in the afternoon, and prepares for her wedding on a daily basis. She knows this means she won't be getting any good sleep for a while. Back in Arnold's office, Oliver wonders about the midnight snack he had with Riche. Arnold thinks of when Riche said she was a terrible cook, 
but smiled, saying the food was actually quite good. Next morning, Rishay finds herself a little exhausted from all the research she did last night. She then suddenly sees someone sleeping in her garden, and the knights tell her to head back to her room. But she couldn't help but think black hair is rare in their country. The boy wakes up and says he's pleased to meet his lovely older sister. He apparently sent so many letters saying he wanted to meet her, but Arnold didn't send a reply to a single one of them. The boy laughs, telling them not to be so tense. After all, he's Arnold's younger brother, Theodore August Hine, second in line to the throne. Rishay politely responds to his greeting, even though Arnold said not to humor him. Theodore is surprised to find out Rishay had been working on this garden all by herself. He tells her he sees something strange, and when she comes over to check, his tone becomes serious and he tells her, I want to save you. He thinks of it sad that she was dragged here to be a hostage in their country. However, Rishay is aware, but satisfied since Arnold is considerate of her. Theodore's demeanor then becomes playful again as he says his goodbyes. As Rishay walks through the halls, she thinks of when Theodore introduced himself as second to the throne. That's not something a person would say to their older brother's fiance. Rishay then asks the two guards if Arnold and Theodore have a good relationship with each other. However, Camille tells her he isn't allowed to disclose that information. She knows she'll have to deal with their situation at some point, but for now, she has to focus on her negotiations with Chief Tully. She then walks in on Arnold telling someone that the kingdom's military forces will only be used to protect the people. The man asks why Arnold is ignoring the regional lords just to protect the commoners. Arnold replies that the nobility have their private armies, and the fact that the kingdom provides the funds to maintain them should be more than enough. The man tells him to reconsider, especially since Arnold's father will not be happy with this decision. However, Arnold refuses to argue, telling the man to know his place. He then looks at Rishay, who looks back at him to cheer him on, implying Rishay agrees with his sentiment. This makes Arnold sigh and smile, which comes off so endearing it makes Rishay gasp. Arnold then explains he'll send private notices to all the regional lords. He understands that he just needs to make protecting the commoners somehow favorable to them. A long-term plan to make the people happy, which would ultimately lead to increased tax revenue for all the regional nobles. Something that even this man can get behind. Rishay thinks back to the knowledge she read in a text. It said that indemnities gained through war are to be invested locally in revitalization and creating employment. This was a policy created by Arnold, making her understand that he'd been forcefully introducing policies that benefit his people, giving her a much better impression of him than she had in all of her past lives. In the evening, she enters her room and finds a letter. It reads, I will confide a secret to you. Be at the chapel tonight at 12, Arnold Hine. Riche enters the chapel, but instead of finding Arnold, she's greeted by none other than his brother, Theodore Hine. Theodore is impressed because just by looking at Riche's demeanor, he could tell she knew it would be him waiting here and not her prince. While fidgeting with his hair, he continues explaining she knows nothing about his older brother, Arnold. He tells her Arnold thinks nothing of killing people. That's the kind of person he is. But little did he know, Arnold has been the cause of her death in six different timelines, where in the last one, she was pierced directly by his blade. He committed numerous massacres in other countries, invading every nation in the world. Theo then reveals Arnold's crimes against humanity are not only during wars, he also killed his own mother. This makes Riche audibly gasp as Theodore continues to emphasize how terrible his brother's deeds were and that one day she'll be killed as well. But Riche's next response is something he wasn't expecting. Is there something wrong with that? She remarks plainly. She then tells him she was fully aware of how wicked Arnold could be and still chose to be his bride anyways. She personally isn't surprised since she knew one day he'd kill his own father and usurp the throne. Theodore tries again to tell Riche she doesn't understand, but she's done with this conversation. Since Arnold is the one he should be talking to, Theodore stares in fear as the sound of the Crown Prince's footsteps approach, and we see Arnold shrouded in darkness as he moves forward. Theodore tries to take back his claims. He tries to reassure to his brother that what he said was a misunderstanding. It isn't how he really thinks, but Arnold simply replies, Theodore. I believe I ordered you to stay away from Riche in the coldest tone. Theodore's eyes widen and he grabs his shawl, completely shaken. He apologizes. However, when Arnold tells Riche it's time to go, she pleads for him to speak with his brother for just a moment. 
He tells her there's no need, making her get a little nervous, but she also complies. She then notices Theodore giggling to himself, and he utters under his breath, Your relationship with him is just as I thought, sister. His demeanor changes back to a regretful facade, as he apologizes to Arnold and tells him he won't say anything mean to Riche anymore. As he takes his leave, he tells his brother he's happy since it's been so long since he'd seen Arnold up close. Arnold then reminds Richet he told her to stay away from his brother too, but she replies since Arnold's name was used, she couldn't ignore it, though she only gambled that he'd show up. Arnold sighs, saying he received a reply from her to a letter he never sent that read she would show up here. He would have been crazy to sit back and relax after that. She thanks him for coming for her, but then her demeanor shifts from positive to concerned. She asks him why the people think he's a cruel person. He then calmly responds, it's probably the truth. Then she proclaims that yes, in the last war he took many lives, but she's seen he's actually kind and considerate when it comes to the people of this country. Arnold then begins reaching his hand forward and he grabs her neck, saying he's been too soft on her. If she wants to survive, she better throw away her naive mindset. But Riche is firm as she trusts what she's seen with her own eyes. But he wonders how she could know since she's never seen him on the battlefield. But she answers back, the person who's shown her the most care and consideration is him. He tells her to stop being ridiculous because he's just using her. However, she tells him, even so, I just can't think of you as cruel, my husband. A phrase that shakes Arnold's core as the two lock eyes. He wonders how Riche could have such resolve. He sees it in her eyes sometimes. The eyes of someone standing on a battlefield. The eyes that speak. If it means that I can stay true to my convictions, then I don't care if I die here. Her eyes tell him she's someone who has that kind of resolve. He then moves his hand to her cheek and acknowledges she seems like someone who would fight to the end. And the times that he had to kill a person with that same kind of resolve were his most terrifying moments of war. This makes Riche's eyes widen. She was shocked that there were actually things that frightened him too. She then tells him she has dreams where she's killed. And when she's awake, she knows she's alive, but sometimes she feels very afraid. Worried that the truth is she's actually dead and the world she's living in now is only a long dream post-mortem. She's shaken again because she didn't realize she had these feelings inside of her. But even so, she's made up her mind. No matter how this life may end, she doesn't want to run away. Because what she carries within her is the resolve to live as his wife, nothing more than that. Arnold gives a smirk, and as he takes his hand off of Riche's cheek, he suddenly pulls her in close for a surprise kiss that is deep with love and passion, something her heart wasn't prepared for. He then calls her a fool, and with a kind look in his eyes, tells her there's no need to have the resolve to be his wife. She simply needs to live as she pleases. The next day in the aftermath, Riche sits by herself, mouth open. She touches her lips, blushing as she thinks about the kiss she received. She couldn't comprehend these feelings, but she kept wondering what he meant when he told her there's no need for her to have resolved to be his wife. Elsie comes up and asks if she's been able to sleep at all, since it seems like she's working all the time. Riche then tells her she's perfectly fine, while deep down, knowing she's at her limits. Elsie then spots Riche's painted nails and remarks at how pretty they are. Apparently, this is the merchandise she's going to propose to Chief Tully. She has Elsie sit down, and as she begins painting her nails, she explains, in the East, they have a country of stained their nails with dyes made from flowers. With that as inspiration, she tried adding color to nail strengthening medicine. That way, one could enjoy being stylish even while scrubbing and washing, since their nails would become more fortified. But also, for people to keep their nails strong, they should be eating meat and fish. Elsie then remarks she'll use some of her pay to buy some sometime, but she can't spare too much money since it's all she has to feed her younger brother and sister. Riche then surmises this nation has a deeply rooted poverty problem from Elsie's family situation, but still continues to paint her nails, something that Elsie can't help but admire their beauty, a sparkling Elsie has never seen before. She then offers to paint Elsie's nails with her favorite color, but Elsie tries to hold back since she doesn't want to overstep Riche's kindness. 
But when Rishay tells Elsie this would make herself happy and that any color would look beautiful on her, Elsie's eyes begin to well up and tears fall, making Rishay wonder if something's wrong. But Elsie confirms that she's just so happy she has no idea what to do. Her family is very poor and their clothes were always in tatters. They could never afford to dress fashionably. She's just so thankful to not only have become Rishay's personal handmaiden, but now also to have been given such a beautiful gift. We then move to the maids preparing Rishay's instructed nail concoction, and as the batch is finished, we see them all awing at the beauty of their sparkling nails. Rishay began thinking there were many girls here like Elsie, suppressing their dreams for the sake of their families. She then comes face to face with Kane again, and with the maids presenting their newly painted nails, she tells him most of the people coming in and out of the capital are men working in their prime, so she's concocted small bottles of nail polish they can bring back to their wives and lovers as souvenirs. Chief Tully applauds Riche on her exceptional work, and tells her he'd like his company to start promoting it right away. One of his employees gets excited as well, but Kane tells him to hold his excitement. As he explains to Riche, he'd likely sell it as a highly priced product intended for nobles, but it's clear to him she doesn't want to do that. This is when Riche starts the business dealings on her terms. She explains three years ago, Prince Arnold had established minimum wage in this country. Kane is surprised to find out Arnold was the one who enacted this, but understands its drawbacks are it can only benefit those able to get employment. Riche confirms this and then explains the nail polish isn't costly to make, but it will require a lot of manpower to create large amounts. So, she wants large-scale hiring to be of the poor folk from the slums, making both Elsie and Camille gasp as they both come from slum family backgrounds. Riche then says she'll only reveal the secret to making the nail polish if Kane agrees to her conditions. Kane then drops the paper and tells her he's disappointed. Camille calls out Kane's insolent remarks, but Riche has him hold it. Kane then sarcastically retorts that if she wants him to perform charitable acts, she better wait until he quits being a merchant and decides to become a clergyman. But Riche is dead serious. She elaborates that after the war, Galkine had created many policies to the benefit of its people, but because of that, the people's average income has increased, but there are still many of those who don't receive these benefits. Unless some method is provided for them, the economy will stagnate, and this will one day lead to a drop in tax revenue. So it's in both the nation's and Kane's best interest to follow her plans for the economy. She then says, someone long ago once told her first class merchants can choose their customers, remembering it to be Kane from her first life. But there's something better than that, producing customers and the people for themselves. Kane is shocked and begins laughing. He loves the idea. Instead of choosing his own customers, instead, if they can make the people of the slums earn income, they will also become their customers as well. As their numbers increase, merchant sales increase as well. And with all of the Aria trading company's wares being splendid, Kane will have the most to gain from this. Then, as the Aria trading employees relish in the idea of profits, Riche thinks about one day giving the people of the slums the money and time to one day pursue their dreams of their own, as she stares at Elsie who is completely taken aback. Right now, as Crown Princess, she needs to create businesses that will bring prosperity to the people of this country. Kane is pleased, but honestly tells Riche she's too earnest, as he's already begun to plot how he can exploit her kindness and wring her dry. But she knew he might not accept her proposal so easily. She wanted to avoid using her ace in the hole, but she's left with no choice. She then pulls out a document that even gets Kane startled. One of his employees asks him if he's alright, but Kane gestures him to stop. He wonders how she could possibly have this. She apologizes as she had to use special methods to find this out. Those methods being that in her past life, Kane's younger sister, Arya Tolly, was really ill. He knows that nothing is strange about that information leaking, since he's gone to many doctors to have them research her condition. Then when Riche explains that she's been cultivating many plants to create a medicine that could cure his sister, Kane gives a shocked look. He's in complete disbelief because Riche isn't a doctor. But she cuts off his words, reminding him of the hangover medicine she gave to him the night when she was in disguise. Kane's men remark that they had terrible hangovers after losing to her in a drinking battle, but after that medicine they took, they all felt better right away, but are now shocked to find out she was the one who had created it. Kane then sighs and covers his head. He recounts that he's always told his subordinates to become merchants that can create their own customers, but now is surprised to have found Riche turning the tables on him. Up until now, this had all been a test to figure out whether or not he'd choose to work with her, 
Never had he imagined it would turn out to be whether or not she'd work with him. He begins begging. He'll give her everything he owns to get that medicine for his little sister. Harishe stops him as she planned to give him the method and the medicinal herbs with no strings attached. Kane is surprised to hear she has no intention of taking advantage of his sister's condition. She just wanted him to understand people of the slums care about their families too to make sure their younger siblings don't get ill, to make sure they can be fed, many older brothers and sisters sacrifice their own dreams to provide for their family. But she needed this clumsy method to bring her proposal to him. She doesn't believe this was about turning the tables, but sincerely wants a chief to help her. The chief comes over to Rishay and kneels. Even though she says there's no need for it, he explains that trade is meant to bring abundance to everyone involved. But he had always foolishly thought to choose his own customers. He admits fault and that he was truly the one who was immature. As the fates of the people in the slums had never meant anything to him before. But now his eyes have been opened to the many children like his sister living there. And that Rishay's business idea is better than anything he could have thought of. He feels ashamed of his own arrogance. Then, with his hand on his heart, he pledges his company to do whatever she asks, and Rishay happily accepts. Later that evening, Rishay breathes a sigh of relief that everything had worked out. She starts to get up but falls back down, causing her guards to come check her condition. She asks them to bring Elsie to her, and later that night, Oliver heads to her room after learning about her current status. But when they walk in, they find no one there. Because in a tavern, we see Prince Theodore removing his hood, thanking both Elsie and Camille for abducting Princess Riche for him, as she lies passed out in a dark storage area. It's nighttime in the slums of the capital, in the kingdom of Galkine. Riche lies passed out and awakens as Theodore, Elsie, and Camille enter where they've kept her. Theodore tauntingly asks how his older sister is doing. Getting kidnapped by the maid you took such good care of. You poor thing. And with his haughty remarks, she nervously asks why he would do this to her. To Theodore, it is all to make his big brother angry, of course. Because up until now, Arnold hasn't been giving him any attention. Except now that he's interacting with Riche. He feels Arnold is finally looking at him. Finally turning his angry emotions towards him. This realization gave Theodore what he called a sense of peace deep within his heart, and he begins laughing maniacally. With soft eyes, Riche remarks that Theodore wants to be closer to his brother, doesn't he? This makes Theodore's laughter come to a stop as he audibly questions what she means. He's done talking about this, and as he takes his leave to go mess with his brother, he tells Riche to enjoy her time here. Riche flashes back to earlier, where she had fallen from exhaustion due to the late night staying up and winning her negotiation for business with Kane Tolley. Elsie and Camille were the first ones to see and offer to take care of her. However, when Riche heard both of their offers to help, she immediately asked if Prince Theodore ordered the two of them to do something to her, which surprised the both of them and led to Elsie asking how Riche knew. Riche deduced this after the letter she received from Prince Theodore the other day. Who else entered Riche's room regularly other than Elsie? Also, she's the only maid here from the slums. Camille was also raised there too, and Riche knew that for many years, Prince Theodore had been privately supporting all of the poor folk out there. With Riche having figured everything out, Camille plainly answers that Theodore has ordered them to imprison her, without hurting her, of course. But what she does next, no one was expecting. She tells the two in quotes to imprison her, just as Prince Theodore had ordered, which left both Camille and Elsie flabbergasted. Theodore and Arnold come to meet, with Theodore playfully teasing that his brother has come to see him. Theodore just laughs because it's been so long since the two of them had spoken together like this. Then Theodore drops his playful tone, telling Arnold that he better listen if he wants Riche back. However, Arnold just calmly responds that Theodore gets to the point. This is when Theodore plainly says that he wants to be the new crown prince, and that's the only way he'll give Riche back. If Arnold doesn't comply, harm will come to her. But all Arnold does is look in silence. Theodore sees Arnold's expression as unconcerned, but feels he must still be worried. After all, Riche is important to him, but even as Arnold maintains his cold demeanor, Theodore's tone becomes angry. Theodore begins shouting because Arnold treasures Riche, shows interest and concern for her, desires to keep her by his side. Unlike Theodore himself, Theodore feels his big brother doesn't even want to see his face. He then gets face to face with Arnold with an expression of slight sadness. 
He knows all of this because he's been watching Arnold the entire time. But now he just wants Arnold to say that he's won. Say that this time Theodore has beaten him. If he could do just that, Theodore's life would be complete. Arnold then says Theodore's name, which makes him light up a bit. However, all Arnold asks is how he imprisoned Riche. When Theodore responds, he just locked her in a room. Arnold asks, what else? So Theodore proudly explains some rough men are keeping watch of her. And with it being on the upper floor, there's no way she'd escape out of the window. Arnold then utters back, oh, so there's a window, huh? However, Theodore, annoyed, just answers there's no way she's escaping and that if he gets too cross, he will hurt Riche. Arnold just calls him his foolish little brother and says there isn't a single path for Theodore to win here, not even from the moment he thought he had captured Riche. Theodore just gives a dumbfounded look, thinking Arnold isn't acting like himself. But as Theodore is about to get even more mad, Arnold can hear the footsteps and says, here it comes. And with a door slamming open, Theodore looks mouth wide open with disbelief to see none other than our villainess standing before him, smiling. She tells him she's here to settle things. And Theodore, who shook, mutters, this isn't possible. Arnold said he heard she was being held in a room as good as a prison and wonders if she left through the window or maybe she punched a hole through a wall, all saying this with a look of amusement on his face. She answers while feeling a little teased that she went through the door like a normal person. So Arnold teased her further, asking if going through a locked door that's being watched by guards is normal. However, Theodore asks if someone has betrayed him. Riche only responds by saying his name and in a serious tone tells him she has some advice to offer him. She takes a step forward. First, when you capture a prisoner, you must never take your eyes off of them. Have at least two guards in the room with them at all times. As we see, Riche had picked the lock, even had a weapon strapped to her, and after quickly taking down the first guard, she slit her dress, making herself better ready for combat. The men charged after her, but one after one she easily took them down, making Theodore shrink back at the thought of it. Riche's second piece of advice? The search of a prisoner's body should always be concluded by multiple people, as searching a prisoner until they're completely nude is the most effective for finding any tools for escape. As we see her leap down the stairs, slamming one of the guards against the wall. Then as two other guards had come, she smashed one of them in the face and beat the next two with one of the guards getting knocked down to the stairs below. And third, have the prisoner's hands shackled behind their back, even tied them to a pillar. As we see Riche face another two set of guards, she leaped behind them and threw her daggers at one of the guards' faces. She tells Theodore that simply tying a prisoner up is too lenient. It's much better to just break both their arms and legs, restrain those body parts and take everything from them while a group of guards watch. With a serious look, Riche tells him that's what it means to take someone prisoner. Theodore's eyes widen. He gasps aloud, saying, how ferocious a beast Riche truly is. However, when Arnold grabs her shoulders, she softly gasps, with him teasing her again by asking why she's instructing the person who captured her. As he puts his jacket on her, she blushes, saying she's perfectly fine and concerned for his neck showing. And the sight of it surprises Theodore. He wonders where that scar came from. Then Theodore's eyes dim in sadness as he thinks he knew that he wasn't good enough after all. Riche asks what Theodore's goal for all this was. He tries to hide his insecurity and answers to take the throne. What other reason is there for two people in the line of succession to fight for? But Riche doesn't buy that. She believes his objective is to actually abdicate his place in the line of succession. Theodore tries to deny this, but Riche goes on to say at first she didn't know why he would target her. And Theodore interrupts saying, I told you, it's to make my brother suffer. If he couldn't protect his fiance, then his reputation would be completely destroyed. But Riche doesn't believe this, as her place as a hostage fiance from another nation makes her standing incredibly trivial to Arnold's position. She could tell Theodore had instead intended to create a commotion to disgrace himself as a criminal. She then brought up there was a period of time Theodore had ended his public work in the slums and he responded he grew weary of the ludicrous charity work. But Riche knew that was a lie, as even recently he's been sending money to the slums, even though there isn't any evidence of public funds being used. She concludes he must have been sending his own money, that Theodore worries more for the people of the slums than anyone else, all while neglecting his royal duties. Theodore denies this, saying he just wanted to beat his brother, that's all. 
But Riche refutes this, saying if that were true, then he'd just attack Arnold directly. He won't because Riche knows everything Theodore does is for his older brother's sake. But Theodore vehemently denies this. He just repeats, you're wrong, 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 over and over, desperately, with his palm covering his face, saying she's only spouting nonsense. He wants his brother to hate him, to despise him, to cast him out. If Arnold won't accept him, then being killed by him would be so much better. However, Arnold says that's enough. He reminds Riche he told her not to interact with Theodore. Riche tries to express Theodore's true feelings of desperate love for his brother, but Arnold only coldly answers that he doesn't care, which makes Theodore look as if his soul had been shattered. Arnold says that regardless of what Theodore desires, it has nothing to do with him. Theodore, under his breath, says he knew that all along. He then runs out of the room, and Arnold tells Riche to leave him be. She asks why Arnold is intentionally distancing himself from Theodore. However, when Arnold refuses to answer, Riche brings up what Arnold had said the other day about her not needing to have resolved to be his wife. She had been trying to understand his words and what he meant by them. She concluded that Arnold's looking for a future where he could throw everything away, something that Theodore probably understands as well. That's why he's probably afraid. That's why he puts on the act of being the second prince, even though he has no aspirations to ascend the throne. But she can't help but feel there has to be a different way to do things. She pleads for Arnold to tell her what he's thinking. The room becomes stiffly silent, as if Arnold is contemplating how to answer. He breathes a small sigh, and Riche is relieved. She'll finally break through the beast of a prince, but becomes nervous now seeing a vicious, killer gaze, the same one he gave the night he killed her, as he says he's finally confirmed it. Riche steps back as he tells her she's quite adorable while maintaining this same look. He tells her she can't understand his intentions, so she feels confused. But ultimately, it's better she doesn't understand his heart. He reminds her once again to leave Theodore alone, and remarks that Theodore should have never gotten involved with someone like him. Riche's expression brightens as she confirms Arnold does truly adore his brother, because if he didn't, he would have never said something like that. She then asks if he ever considered a future opposite to one where he would disappear and tells Arnold to live his life in a way that he has no regrets. She then walks up to Arnold and tells him she intends to live her life as his wife with no regrets and walks away. She comes out exhausted as she's barely hanging on by a thread from all the events that had transpired. We then see Theodore looking up at the sky. He thinks back to his time on the battlefield as he cared for the injured. The time where suddenly they heard from their comrades their camp was under attack. And with the enemies pointing their blades at the injured soldiers, Theodore came in to sacrifice himself, closing his eyes as he was about to be struck by their blade. The sound of swords clanging rang, and when Theodore opened his eyes, he found his brother standing before him with all of the enemies defeated. Arnold looked back, saying he can't praise Theodore's actions, since an imperial family member should never throw their life away for the people, and tells him not to put his life at risk next time. However, Arnold does say that the fact that Theodore was willing to protect his vassals is something he should be proud of, which made Theodore's eyes light up. Riche appears from behind him, and Theodore quips, asking if she's going to follow up her lecture on imprisonment with one on escaping. He smiles and tells her that Arnold never shows his achievements to the outside world. On the other hand, lets his infamy spread to all the other countries. Riche knows Arnold does this intentionally, and she was right on the money, Theodore knew this entire time that his brother had been acting in a way that would let him disappear at any time. But it saddened Theodore to know a person as wonderful as his brother would leave them. To Theodore, this isn't right. He concludes if Arnold intends to disappear, leaving the Empire to him, then Theodore just needs to disappear first. And with a glum smile, he tells Riche it's the only way he can be useful to his brother. Riche knows Arnold is probably planning something like that but she plans to use everything to stop him, even if she has to also rely on the help of others. But she also needs Theodore's help too, something that he's surprised to hear. He doubts this, saying he'll never be useful enough to help her. But Riche refutes this. That isn't true. Theodore is the only little brother Arnold has in the whole world, a phrase that Theodore wants to desperately accept, but his insecurities scream at him to deny it. He always wanted to help his big brother. He thanks Riche, because her saying that she needed him was unexpected, but made him happy. But he's already decided how he can be most useful. Something he should have done a long time ago. He sits himself atop the ledge 
and begins his backwards descent. Rishay chases after him but fails as she's out of strength. As Theodore sees the stars, he closes his eyes, accepting his place in this world. Only for a hand to reach out and grab him. A hand by none other than his older brother, Arnold Hine. Arnold pulls him up and slaps Theodore across the face, with Rishay staring, mouth agape. In an angry and concerned tone, Arnold asks what Theodore was thinking, and even though Theodore tries to continue with his shtick of saying this is the only way he can be useful, Arnold reminds him that he himself has never once done anything to be a big brother to Theodore. So why would Theodore be stupid enough to risk his life for someone like him? Rishay then tells Arnold that even though his little brother is doing it wrong, Theodore's desire to support Arnold is still right. Then Theodore confirms he'd wish the same thing over and over. He desperately wants to be useful to Arnold, in any way he can be, because Arnold is his only big brother in the whole world and the person he looks up to the most. As the wind blows, it's silent with all eyes on Arnold. Arnold simply tells Theodore to never do anything this foolish again, the same as he had said protecting Theodore when they were at war. And Theodore's heart begins to fill as he hears that his dear brother actually remembered that moment, with Arnold confirming he does. Theodore's eyes well up, and he wails, apologizing for his actions to his dear brother and sister. Arnold tells him he understands and to stop crying, and Rishay smiles at the heartwarming moment. Arnold then approaches his fiancée, and Rishay tells him she's glad that both of them were able to mend things. But her vision starts to go black, and Arnold catches her. Theodore gets worried, thinking it's all his own fault. However, Arnold tells him she's just sleeping. Theodore's in shock that she can sleep after all that's happened and sees how beautiful his brother and sister-in-law look together. Arnold gets up with Richet in arms and tells Theodore to call the carriage, with Theodore stunlocked as his brother walks away with the love and warmth he's never seen Arnold express. After hearing Arnold say he'd trust him to escort Richet home, Theodore felt happy to hear his brother acknowledge him, bringing a happy dawn to the eventful night. Richet rises from bed to see Arnold getting up now that she's awakened. She asks if he stayed with her all night and apologizes. He's glad to hear she's alright and hands her a letter. It's from Theodore and it reads, Dear sister, I'm sorry for doing all those awful things to you. There are so many things I want to say, but firstly, I promise to repay the debt I owe you. And you said you'd stop whatever it is that my brother is trying to do, didn't you? Given the way things are, I'd like to help you with that. To that end, I'll let you borrow my people in the slums. That's what people refer to as a common front, right? Come to me for help anytime, with due gratitude to me, of course. She smiles as she reads the last lines. Thank you, big sister. She asks Arnold if he had a talk with his brother after she passed out, but he just responds wanting to know why she's smiling like that. Well, it's because she's happy, of course. As Arnold continues his work, he wants her to think of something else she wants. After all, he broke his promise not to touch her again. She then blushes, remembering when Arnold had grabbed her in for his passionate kiss, and hides her flusteredness in the sheets, saying, I, I don't need anything. More importantly, she wants to know why he'd do such a thing to her. But when he responds asking if she wants to know why, she gets more embarrassed saying, she does not. He then looks at her and smiles, thanking Rishe for taking care of his little brother. She at first lets out a gasp, but then warmly answers that it's no problem. After all, Theodore will be her little brother too. In Theodore's office, Rishi thanks him for making sure Camille and Elsie wouldn't be receiving punishment for capturing her, but he tells her there's no need to thank him. Rishi's heard that the policies for improving the slums have been moving forward thanks to his leadership. It's something that his brother Arnold had suggested to him, something that Theodore blushes over as he'll be attending all the political meetings with his older brother on this one, the eye of his admiration. He wonders if Rishi came here just to tease him over this, but actually she has a favor to ask him, something that might be troublesome for young Theodore. We see Arnold opening an official letter from the Kingdom of Coyolis, sighing at its potential contents. Then enters Rishay, who Arnold notices seems kind of tense. She takes a heavy breath to tell him a room has been prepared for him at the villa. What? Why would this errand make her so nervous? Well, Rishay's maids had been working on preparing it so diligently, so the quality of the room is like a graduation exam for them. Arnold recalls Riche wanted the two of them to live in separate housing, but she's changed her mind. She definitely wants to live there with her prince. Arnold just gives his devilish smile and affirms her, saying, It seems like you're plotting something amusing again. 
Why, Rishay would never plan anything that could cause him problems. He decides to get up, accepting his fate in her usual schemes, but admits seeing her has improved his mood, leaving Rishay shocked, unsure of what he means. While retaining her bewildered look, Oliver thanks Rishay for helping Arnold take his mind off the task at hand. Arnold thinks of how splendid the room truly is, as the villa had been abandoned for the last three years, and he's impressed Rishé has already fixed it up, being here for only the last three months. He's glad Rishé took the time to teach the novice maids, because now that they've learned the trade, they can work anywhere. But even more importantly, they've gained a sense of pride. They can accomplish their work and earn the praise of another. Arnold brightly acknowledges Rishé for having a talent for giving people a sense of self-respect, leaving her completely stun-locked. He's surprised that's the expression she makes when he finally compliments her. However, she just thinks he's teasing her again, but he assures her the praise is heartfelt. Rishé thinks that even if it was a lie, a compliment from him makes her very happy. She opens the balcony doors to reveal this room gets the best view, explaining the breeze might be great for a nap. Arnold thinks the best part of this room is that it's next to Rishé's. That way he'll get news of her reckless antics sooner rather than later. But Rishé reminds him her plan is to spend her time lazing around, so she won't be doing anything reckless. All while fidgeting her fingers muttering, well, not much anyway. Rishé then reminds Arnold about his promise to spar with her he made during their engagement announcement ball. She's excited because she only needs one time to learn the special training methods used by the Knights of Gaokain. Arnold asks her what makes her think their techniques are special. So Rishé explains that since coming to the palace, she's watched everyone train a number of times, but the movement and striking style of the Imperial Knights here is clearly a cut above the rest. Arnold agrees, since he promised to do anything for his wife-to-be. Then Rishé exclaims how happy she is because Arnold's sword work is the most beautiful and powerful in all the world. Smiling under his breath, he replies, in all the world, huh? Unable to say she was pierced by it in her previous life, she says it's just a turn of phrase of course, but Arnold thinks a skill that's only meant for killing people couldn't possibly be labeled as beautiful. The couple takes their ready stance and Arnold lectures Rishé that once someone acquires an incorrect habit, it's generally too late to unlearn it. All while the knights stare nervously at the two about to duel. Especially since Arnold is using bolt and arm and leg restraint to help him closely mimic actual battlefield conditions. To help him practice to continue fighting even if he were to lose a limb. She's impressed because Arnold even has a blindfold covering one eye of a face that seems quite handsome. He then explains even with only one arm, he'll continue to swing. Even with a shattered leg, he'll continue to advance. And even with both eyes lost, he'd continue to look for a path to cut down his enemy. Fighting with this intent always active will ensure he always survives. Rishé heard that a knight's path pursues nobility and beauty and surviving to kill the enemy is part of this. She acknowledges this was the reason why she was no match for him before. She threw her life away too early in their first duel. Arnold then tells her he's got no intention of injuring his wife-to-be, who's prepping for their marriage ceremony. Rishé is a little surprised to hear that, but wants to wager if she wins, Arnold answers one question of hers no matter what it is. And if she loses, she'll grant one wish to Arnold, no matter what that is. So he accepts, ready to take on this bet. The match begins, and they remain at a standstill. Rishé knows the longer a fight between them goes on, the longer she'll be at a disadvantage. She breathes in and goes for a frontal attack, only getting parried away. Arnold tells her to come at him, and she thinks her center of balance is unstable, so she readjusts herself and gets in closer to swing, but Arnold dodges and parries, all while telling her she's sloppy, relying on strength alone. She needs to make use of her nimbleness, and as she gets slashed away, Rishé is impressed that he's able to give pointers on exactly what she needs to improve on. The other knights stare, remarking how impressed they are that Rishé is improving so much on the spot. After a few more blows, Arnold takes a stance that reminds Rishé of a slash that struck her before. She dodges, which even surprises Arnold. She knows his next attack will come from above, but she narrowly dodges again, only to nearly fall apart. Even though she knows what's coming, her body is having a hard time keeping up. Arnold reminds Rishé she said his sword play was the most powerful in the world, but her movements show she must know someone even stronger than him. Even with the two of them sparring, Arnold concludes she must be thinking of that stronger person, and he gets envious just thinking about it. Rishé assures him, no, he's definitely the strongest, especially knowing he'll be even stronger five years from now. Cruel, overwhelming, and formidable. Rishé braces herself again, and the two cross blades like a dance. She takes Arnold's strike, just like that very night. 
but it seems Arnold has knocked her sword away. She collapses, exhausted from their exchange, and as Arnold gets unbinded, he remarks he was impressed because he wasn't even planning on moving a single step. As he unbinds her, he says, you'll do any one thing I want, is that right? So he has her agree to go out with him in town two days from now. But he wonders why she's not getting up. Rishay nervously tries to tell him to go on without her. Because from their duel, her arms and legs are still shaking. She's a little taxed and is gonna rest first. Arnold grabs his chin to think for a second. And decides to pick her up, which makes her blush and scream. She fusses and kicks around from being princess carried. And as they continue to walk, Arnold asks what she would have wanted to know about him if she had won. Being asked like this, she knew it. He's having fun watching her reactions. She learns his birthday is December 28th and that he has no particular interests or hobbies, all while being carried away. On the next day, Riche heads out and learns Arnold is moving his office to a new room in the villa. She asks where her prince is, and Oliver explains last night Arnold had to suddenly take command of the Night Watch and hasn't slept yet. Oliver encouraged him to nap, but Arnold decided to continue performing his official duties instead. She heads to Arnold's office telling him she wants him to rest. But as he works, he says there's no point in him resting during the day because he can feel everyone moving about the palace. So Riche takes on the task, saying she'll lull her prince to sleep. In his new room, Riche has put her prince to bed, deciding she'll stay by his side until he sleeps. He sighs because what she's saying to him doesn't make any sense. But she explains if she's here, he won't be distracted by any far off presences. Arnold then rests his eyes and Riche stares at him peacefully. She notices him breathing and figures this must not be working. So she asks if she can lie next to him. He happily looks at her and sighs. She hops on the bed and softly pats her prince as this is a technique that imitates a heartbeat, something that can calm the heart and mind. As she stares at him, she remembers in her life as a maid, she used to do this for her lady. She tells him if done to a young child, they'd fall asleep quickly. Arnold smiles because Riche is the only person who would treat him like that. And as he rests, she continues to stare at her prince, all while patting him lightly. She takes notice of his scar, and Arnold says she can do what she likes with it. So she reaches out her hand and runs her fingers across. Arnold grabs her hand, looking annoyed, and tells her if they were going to do this, he should have been wearing gloves. That way he could have made a counterstroke. But Riche blushes, saying, touching her through gloves doesn't make it all right. However, he just whispers, it was a joke. Riche stares further, with eyes glimmering, thinking about how Arnold is so sincere and oddly conscientious. While on the other hand, she isn't being fair. She undoes her dress a little, telling him he can touch, especially if it can make him feel better. But he just stuffs her with a pillow, and when they get super face to face, the expression she's making is revenge enough for him. He does think it's odd that she thinks nothing of sleeping beside him, but making eye contact somehow unsettles her. Riche was hoping, however, to make him feel at ease, since his home isn't supposed to be a battlefield. He thinks if that's true, he wants Riche to stay until he falls asleep, because it's far more pleasant than an empty room. However, it turns out Riche actually fell asleep, with Arnold watching her. They hear Oliver calling, so Arnold covers her in a blanket and tells her to be quiet, as he listens to a report Oliver received. After that, Riche heads back to her quarters. She received a gift from the Aria Trading Company, and knows starting tomorrow, she's going to be very busy. As we see, she's disguised herself into the Gaokine Knights, training squad and reporting for duty. The Gaokine Knight training arc begins, with Riche posing as Lucius falling behind the other trainees. We turn back to the request she made of Theodore the other day, which was to gain his help in enrolling her into the Knights as a man. Theodore doesn't believe he should help her with such a ridiculous request, but in the letter he sent her the other day, he did say she could ask for help anytime. He wonders why she wants to enroll in the Knights, as they could just simply hire a private instructor for her. But we Riche knows that if she did have a personal tutor, they'd probably be over considerate of her, and she desires to be trained without any mercy. At first, Theodore remains reluctant because he himself wouldn't be willing to go under harsh training. But he has a shift in perspectives, wanting to assist his lovely older sister, as the whole idea now seems entertaining. His older brother Arnold would never predict his fiancée to dress as a man to infiltrate the knights. As Theodore revels in the idea of pranking his brother, Riche gets nervous because that's not her intention at all. We get that sadistic smile from young Theodore as he says, I would love to see the look on my brother's face, whatever it is. Which only gets Riche more nervous. Riche is exhausted at the end of the 
training day and is mind boggled at how intensive Gaokain's training regimen is. Another trainee named Fritz comes by to check on her. She says she's fine, but Fritz decides to sit next to her because if he headed back to his inn, he'd just be by himself. He came here from Satena, a port town in the north. It's where the ships from Coyolis dock, and he never would have come if he didn't look up to Prince Arnold so much, making Riche sweat hearing the praise for Gaokain's war hero. Fritz then gets scolded by Count Lawvine, as Fritz should be referring to Prince Arnold as his highness rather than his first name. Riche is surprised because the Count is the guardian of the north and a loyal retainer to the Gaokain imperial family. But three years from now, Arnold will declare him a monstrous criminal and he'll be slaughtered. The Count stares at Riche, and she wonders if he's caught on that she's a woman. But he just simply suggests that she eat more chicken, as Riche of course has less muscle mass than the average man. He then explains that tomorrow he'll be joining their instructors for the night's training, but then gets called away for an audience with Gaokain's emperor. In a private shed, Riche undresses her disguise and prepares her daily outfit back in her room with Elsie. They walk downstairs to greet Arnold and Oliver. However, Arnold walks over to her and whispers, Tomorrow afternoon at 2, come to the western back gate. Don't let anyone see you. Afterwards, back in her room, Elsie wonders why Riche and Arnold were speaking secretly. Well, it's because tomorrow is their stroll around the town that Arnold won during their duel. Riche wants to wear something more casual. However, Elsie grabs her hand, getting Riche confused as Elsie wants to make her look more lovelier than anyone else could. The next day, Arnold and Riche make it far enough to lower their hoods. He tells Riche not to be concerned in removing hers, as no one in the kingdom really knows who she is. She gets nervous to take the tarp off, and reveals the beautiful preparation Elsie had done for her hair, makeup, and outfit. There's a second of silence. Riche was worried because she assumed they were meeting out here for more official business, and maybe this outfit is a little much. Arnold just assumes since Riche is Riche, that she would have more than likely come in a linen dress and plain rope, making her shout, Am I really that predictable? Arnold says what she's wearing is no problem and praises Elsie for her work. The two head to the marketplace, and Riche marvels at the variety of Gaokain's local stalls. Arnold remarks that it's just like any normal marketplace, but Riche doesn't think so. After all, there's Kokido's famous grapes and rare aloof bird eggs. She gets so excited, she has to recompose herself and become more professional, saying, um, a marketplace does, of course, show the current economic conditions, but it also reflects the public peace of the surrounding areas. She finds a special stand with fruit imported from Coyolas. She brings some back for Arnold to try, who asks, what is with this disquieting object? She knows the fruit looks unusual, but it's very nutritious and good for the body. As she moves it towards his face, he says wait, but she interrupts him, reiterating it'll be good for him. He sighs at his persistent lovely fiance, but takes a bite, and even though Riche tells him it's sweeter than it looks, huh? He simply wipes his mouth and says, it tastes like it's nutritious. Arnold tells Riche it's time to move, because if they stay in one place too long, Oliver's deputies will find them and we see Oliver sigh at the disappearance of his lord. Riche falls behind, surprised to hear Arnold is skipping out on official duties today. As they head down a staircase, Arnold remarks that the proprietor here doesn't come to the palace, so it's necessary that he visit here personally. They're greeted by the store owner, Mihaela, and inside are presented beautiful jewels. Mihaela asks Riche which among these are fake, but Riche has no clue. Mihaela praises Riche for her honesty, however, Riche isn't done yet, as she wants some appraisal tools to test them for herself. Riche examines the jewels and determines each one to have a high degree of transparency with very fine cuts, but declares all three of the stones to be imitations. Arnold smiles and Mihaela praises Riche on her skills, but Mihaela praises her even more so because even though Riche recognizes the jewels as fakes, she also knows there must be many people who still love and care for these precious stones. Arnold goes to sit down on a nearby couch, telling the store owner to let Riche pick what she wants. Riche is surprised because she thought she was here to fulfill his wishes, but didn't account for the only wish he has here, which is to allow him to gift her a ring. Mihaela explains that Arnold wants to gift his bride a ring during their wedding ceremony, of course. Riche only became more shocked as rings apparently aren't customary in the kingdom of Gaokain. She turns to Arnold asking how their sparring match led him to this conclusion. So he responds that if he said he'll buy her a ring, pick what she likes, Riche would refuse because she doesn't easily accept others buying her things. He then makes his play that by spending his idle wealth here, it's going back into the economy, something that even Riche can't argue with. She stares at jewels, wondering if, since it's a wedding ceremony, that a diamond would be best, or perhaps an emerald since it 
did match her eyes. Rishi is unsure of what to buy, so the store owner offers a suggestion. Putting on a favorite piece of jewelry and wearing it proudly, just that simple action can fill a girl with courage. This will become her very own protective amulet, so she should pick something she genuinely likes. Mihaela asks Rishi what her favorite color is, and Rishi stares at Arnold's eyes. They're like crystal clear ice from a frozen sea in a cold country. As she continues to stare without much thought, she asks if there's a stone here that's the same color as her prince's eyes. With everyone looking in silence, Rishi finds herself flustered. As Mihaela gushes over Rishi's admiration, Rishi assures her it isn't like that. What she said about his eyes didn't have any unusual meaning, just that she's always liked their color. But Mihaela laughs at Rishi and gets up to find just what she's looking for, all while Rishi covers her face in embarrassment, asking Arnold forget what she said. In the evening, the two head to the city walls to watch the beautiful sunset. Arnold asks why the ring was measured to be on her left hand. Rishi knows that putting a ring finger on the third finger of the left hand during a wedding ceremony is a custom in the country she was born in. She then asks why Arnold decided to give her a ring. He replies there's no particular reason, and the ring holds no specific meaning, but he'd feel good about her wearing an ornament he gave her for her hands, since she's always using them. Rishi gets quiet, and with a flushed face, tells him the morning the ring is finished, she'll show it to him before anyone else. The two continue to watch the sunset, until Rishi mentions the arrival of Count Lavine. Arnold answers he's the one who called the Count here as Count Lawvine is the best qualified person to instruct the Knight candidates. But Rishi doesn't buy that. She asks who Arnold has really been waiting for. Count Lawvine protects a very important location to the north. She can't imagine he'd be called here to simply train recruits. Arnold asks what she's getting at, but Rishi noticed Arnold frequently checked his pocket watch. She at first thought he was concerned about what time to return to the palace, but since they've arrived here, he hasn't once taken out his watch. Additionally, this is a spot where one can observe people entering the capital. He then answers that the other day, he received a letter from the country of Coyolas. It said that the sender wouldn't be able to attend the wedding, so they would come to celebrate in advance. Before he could send a reply to say that wouldn't be necessary, a second letter arrived, saying they wanted to celebrate as soon as possible, so they're coming without waiting for a reply from Arnold. As they see a set of carriages arrive, Arnold covers Rishi's head with her hood, but knowing the carriage emblems, she thinks of Prince Kyle of Coyolas from one of her previous lives. We then see Arnold and Rishi back at the castle, and they believe Kyle must have a particular aim in coming here. A knock on the door and enters Prince Kyle Cleverly of Coyolas. Kyle congratulates Arnold on his marriage and is representing his father, the current king here, in hopes of celebrating the event. Rishi knows there's a huge difference in strength between Gaokine and Coyolas. Coyolas is a country that produces gems, gold, and silver. Extremely wealthy, but for most of the year, they're cut off by snow. For food and other necessities of daily life, they depend upon trade with their neighboring countries. But five years from now, they are destroyed in the war that Prince Arnold instigates. Arnold has Rishi introduce herself to Kyle, and as Kyle kneels, to her surprise, he calls her a warm, beautiful goddess. Arnold doesn't take too kindly to this, and Rishi can tell he's staring with killing intent. Privately, Rishi asks Arnold if he learned anything from their interaction. However, everything Prince Kyle had said was completely innocuous, making Rishi nervous remembering Arnold's killer stare. But Arnold just deflects and remarks that Kyle seems to have brought many academics from his country. Rishi thinks back to her second life, where she worked as an herbalist, and with the help of Dr. Michael Evan, was able to help Prince Kyle get over his sickness. Arnold says he'll make arrangements for her to meet with the scholars if she wants. She's excited to because she's heard Prince Kyle is very weak, and she has some medicine she'd like for him to try. Tomorrow, there will be a welcome feast for Kyle, and Arnold plans to have him meet face to face with Count Levine in order to keep Kyle's potential schemes in check. However, Rishi is worried with Levine meeting them at the party tomorrow, the fact that she's the new trainee Lucius could be revealed. As Rishi goes through her garden, she contemplates on how to avoid Count Lawvine discovering her identity while simultaneously providing medicine for Prince Kyle. She knows that if Kyle doesn't receive medicine, he'll soon become unable to move. Rishi's guards brace themselves as a stranger approaches. However, Rishi is pleasantly surprised to see that it's Dr. Michelle Haven, the man who helps cure Prince Kyle during her second life, and also as her teacher in the medical arts in her third life. We turn back time to Rishi's life with the doctor. He asks her thoughts on the aurora that was before them, wondering if its beauty provided inspiration for Rishi's research. 
Rishi apologized for having him travel all the way there just to help her out. But he told her there's no need for apologies. She was his student. If there's anything she wanted to know, he was willing to teach her. But if there was something she wanted to achieve with her own efforts, he wouldn't interfere. He then introduces himself to them as a traveler from Coriolis. The knights tell him if he's lost, they can escort him back. But the doctor replies that he isn't lost at all. He's interested in Rishi because of her herb planting and picking. Rishay introduces herself and asks Michelle if he's a scholar. He confirms and comments that, with just one look at her nails, he can tell she used sap from gelwood trees, despite the dyed color. He asks what method she used to harden it. She explains in great detail and the two conversate back and forth on the intricacies and theories of the nail polish. Michelle finds her thought process so admirable, he consider making her his apprentice. Rishay gasps, but takes on his request, just for the time that he's staying here. He agrees, which pleases Rishay. She happily exclaims he'd be just like her professor, a title that he really enjoys the sound of. However, Rishay would have never imagined a time where she'd be able to call him professor again. Michelle then comments on how the herbs in this garden seem right out of his level of expertise. To her surprise, he asks Rishay if she's intending on giving Prince Kyle medicine. We then see Rishay and Kyle sit face to face, and while the prince is happy to see her again, he wonders why Dr. Michelle arranged for the two of them to meet. The doctor explains Rishay had just become his student, but also she has medicine that could help cure his disease. Even with the medicine being outside of his level of expertise, the doctor desires to help cure the prince from the bottom of his heart. So that's why he wants Kyle to go along with the experimental medicine. Rishay doesn't think it's appropriate to experiment on the prince. However, Kyle has been determined to use any method to be cured especially with the best doctor in Coyola's kingdom backing her, he agrees to use Rishay's methods. Rishay then prepares and presents them the medicine. There is one drawback, however. The medicine has an incredibly revolting taste, and they should have water ready for Kyle to drink with it as well. But without a second thought, the doctor takes a liquid and starts shoving it down Kyle's throat. Kyle pulls away, covering his mouth as if to prevent himself from completely gagging and throwing up. The doctor, with a quizzical enthusiasm, asks Kyle how it tastes. Kyle shakingly responds, the method is like bitter mixed with sour, combined with a particular stench that swoops in like a horse stable. And upon swallowing, a strange slimy sweetness wrapped around his tongue. But Rishay cuts him off saying, there's no need to go any further. She calls her guards to get more water, but it isn't fast enough to stop the doctor from forcing more medicine into Kyle immediately. Afterwards, the prince gets escorted to his room. And back in the room they were in, the doctor offers her one of his books. Upon opening it, Rishay stares in glee, realizing it's the doctor's research records. As she reads, she remembers the doctor remarking that she really hated that medicine, didn't she? While we see Dr. Michelle examining the bottle. This makes Rishay nostalgic. The doctor had always found her to be a fascinating girl, intelligent as well. And to him, her only flaw being that she wants to use her knowledge and skills to make people happy. His philosophy is that it's not good to try to make everyone happy. Happy. He believes that if something is born in this world as a poison, then it should fulfill its role and bring misfortune to people. Rishay questioned this, however, asking back if it was truly impossible for poison to bring someone happiness. Rishay and the doctor could never see eye to eye on this topic. A knock on the door from the guards alerted Rishay her escort has come, and before them, to her surprise, appears her husband-to-be, Prince Arnold Hine. She gets up to introduce Dr. Michelle Haven the scholar who will be teaching her various things while she's here. The doctor gets up to give formalities and is pleased because Arnold has given permission for him to request any information from Rishay and in their library. As Arnold and Rishay leave, she asks her prince why he suddenly came to escort her. It turns out he just happened to be on his way back. He wonders if Rishay is always up and about this late in the night. So Rishay replies she tends to lose track of time when absorbed in her work. He then throws her his pocket watch. It was something he had always found convenient for keeping track of time accurately during battles. Richet was surprised to see how flexible Arnold was with new technology. Since in this world, pocket watches haven't existed for long. She then explains to Arnold her herbalist teacher from the kingdom of Renha would use watches all the time while working. And this pocket watch made her nostalgic. Arnold asked how her herbalist teacher compared to Dr. Michelle. However, she said they weren't really comparable. Dr. Michelle was more of a specialist in mixing things together. A better title to fit him would be something like an alchemist. On the evening of the party, as Rishay prepared herself, Elsie comes by with a letter from the jewel shop owner Mihaela. 
Rishay was previously told her ring would take about a month to complete, but to her surprise, it'll be finishing sooner than expected, which causes Rishay to smile at the schematic concept of her ring to be. At Prince Kyle's welcome party, the nobles all converse amongst themselves, as Arnold and Rishay watch over them. She tells Arnold his face is showing the fact that he finds this party tedious, but he tells her he isn't doing that on purpose. Kyle comes up to thank Arnold for throwing him this party, and also, he's feeling a lot better after taking the medicine. With that, Rishé gives her greeting formalities and heads downstairs, bracing herself to keep focus from getting exposed that she's been training with the Gaokine Knights. The world around her becomes gray and colorless, as she focuses and pinpoints the location of Count Lawbine, this technique being something she learned during her fifth life. With that, she heads downstairs to converse with the guests, all while trying to avoid the Count. She meets with Lord Whaleman, who thanks Rishé for having visited his mother's shop the other day. The people then begin speaking in hushed whispers, as the proprietor of the particular shop would not even work with Gaokine's former empress. Then, Rishé realized Lord Wellman's mother is none other than Mihaela. She then explained that she merely picked the stone. It was Prince Arnold who wanted to buy something for her at Mihaela's shop, only astonishing the people further hearing their prince actually wanting to give a woman jewelry. Rishé and Lord Wellman chat about her ring that's finishing soon, and while Rishé notices Count Lawvine standing still, she sees Arnold and Kyle on the move. Outside the ballroom area, Prince Kyle asks for Arnold to lend his military power to help the Kingdom of Coyolis. They don't need aid through money or medical care as much as Gaokine's power right now. Rishé comes by to eavesdrop and hears Coyolis' current military power is non-existent, meaning their neighbors could come by and crush them at any time. Prince Kyle just wants something to help protect his citizens and keep them safe. Arnold responds by saying, The existence of a royal family lulled into naivety by peace is questionable, and hearing this makes Kyle nervous. Arnold wants to know what Prince Kyle could give to his kingdom in return for help. Kyle offers medals and gems to Gaokine as their highest priority, even if Coyolis wouldn't be able to profit, which makes Rishé gasp because she knows Kyle is lying and he isn't very good at it. Arnold picks up on this lie immediately, saying Kyle shouldn't insult him. To use a country's main source of income as a bartering tool indefinitely with no profit makes no sense. Arnold then says it's clear what the real reason Kyle has come here with such a proposal. Coriolis must be nearly running out of mineral resources, and Kyle's jaw-dropping says it all. Arnold is done with the discussion. Even with Kyle's pleas for Gaokine's help, he knows Arnold cares deeply for his people and has offered many reforms for Gaokine to help the nation prosper. But Arnold tells Kyle that he's mistaken on his current assumption. Arnold isn't suited for joining hands and helping another nation. With a cold, killer look, Arnold tells the Coyolis prince that invading and taking control of other countries suits him much better. And Rishé knows five years from now, Arnold will become emperor and wage war on the entire world, and will even leave Coyolis bloodied and battered. But now that Prince Kyle has proposed an alliance, she felt that things could be different in this timeline. She remembers in her previous life where Kyle had told her he would do whatever it takes to protect his kingdom, knowing resistance at that time was futile. With Arnold walking away, she wonders what could be done to put Coyolis at equal footing to prevent Arnold's army from destroying them in the future. In the evening, Prince Kyle returns to his quarters, telling Michelle he's depressed because there's no hope in sight. He just learned Arnold's true nature is more or less to invade and take control of another country instead of joining forces with him, giving Michelle a devious expression as he remarks, Oh, he said that? As Michelle smokes outside, he rejoices in the fact that he's finally found the one, the perfect being to use poison the right way, referring to Prince Arnold. The next day, Rishé trains outside in her soldier disguise, venting her frustrations at the idea of Coyoles being invaded. Thus, beginning Arnold's reign of terror, Count Lawvine approaches, praising her for training so early in the morning, however, he senses hesitation in her sword. She admits to being afraid of a future where everyone in this country would be going to war. The Count consoles her, saying it's only natural to be afraid. His son lost his life in the last war, and had died valiantly, so he's very proud. However, in equal measure to his sense of pride, he still wishes his son had lived. He knows a war will rob people of their futures. Others will steal that away. To conquer the fear of that, he believes one must stand and fight, not denying one's own hopes and feelings, but instead using them as fuel to move forward. What is it I myself can do? He tells Rishé to find the answer to that question. With glimmering eyes and a redetermined look, Rishé thanks the Count and lets him take his leave. Her resolve is steeled. She doesn't want Coyolis to fall into ruin, but that isn't all. 
remembering Arnold's words the other night where he crushed Prince Kyle's spirit, claiming himself to be better suited for conquest. Rishi refuses to believe her beloved is truly that kind of person. She's determined to show him. Until later, during training, she stares flabbergasted with Arnold being their special observer. Oh, why him? Why now? Arnold just stares at Rishi plainly, making her nervous. She knows she's definitely been caught. Arnold, however, just tells Lawvine that he wants to see the trainees perform. She's happy to hear Arnold might overlook her actions. But no, he definitely doesn't. Slamming his hand against the wall, he asks her what she's doing here. And Rishi tries to play it off, telling her highness she's pleased to meet him. Especially knowing Arnold would personally speak to a mere knight candidate like herself. Huh? If Lucius isn't the person Arnold thinks he is, then he should have no problem with Arnold touching him. And the two staring face to face reminds Rishi of the time she and Arnold had kissed in the chapel. She begins to blush and tells Arnold to stop, because what if someone sees them? After all, he has a fiance. Arnold agrees with Lucius' statement. However, he thinks of Lucius' manner of speech to be disrespectful for just being a knight candidate. So Arnold teases Rishi, telling her he doesn't know what she's sorry for. He'd rather hear it from her own lips. And she concedes, apologizing for not telling Arnold anything about cross-dressing to join the knight candidate's training. Arnold releases her, and she explains she just wanted to undergo the same training he went under. He sighs, letting it go as long as she's sure to rest, and that no one else finds out about her true identity. And she happily accepts. She's really enjoying the training agenda, remarking Arnold's ideas for night prep to be magnificent, while also simultaneously frustrated thinking those same knights will be sent to war. She then tells him she overheard his conversation with Prince Kyle. Upon hearing this, Arnold already knows what she's thinking, that their nation should ally with Coyolas. But he feels there's no value in a country that has lost all its power, when a nation is baited to collapse. The only question is how to deal the final blow. With this cold response, Rishi objects, saying he doesn't really feel this way. However, Arnold just walks away, saying, For this empire, war is not a cruel choice, but simply one means of politics. In her room, Rishi recounts the first time she met Prince Kyle as a traitor. With Cain and his traveling merchants arriving through the soaking rain, Kyle thanked them deeply since their kingdom lacks material resources. They thrive with traitors bringing them items that helped preserve their daily lives. She had a good impression of him since he treated people of differing classes with respect. The second time she met him as an herbalist, he was still the same. The third time, he convinced his father to help her and Michelle's medical research. The next day, she met with Kyle to offer him more medicine and pill form, and he accepted, knowing it'd be disgusting. However, Rishi then began speaking of the true purpose of their meeting today. She had overheard the conversation between him and Arnold at his welcoming party, which caused Kyle to gasp because she saw him in an embarrassing state. He knows the appropriate thing to do after failing to gain an alliance with Arnold would be to leave the country, but he feels he can't afford to give up. Rishi felt concerned for Kyle. Didn't he know that Arnold personally beheaded the members of conquered nations' royal families? Kyle is well aware. As he's researched Arnold thoroughly, he felt Arnold's cruelty towards other nations might have been a guise for his true intentions to protect his people. Even killing monarchs from the other nations was most likely done to prevent future uproars of rebellion. He felt Arnold did this out of compassion for the newly annexed citizens of Gaokine. Despite knowing this, Kyle refuses to give up. However, she wasn't expecting Rishi to tell him she'd like to form an alliance. Later, Rishi meets with Michelle to return his research notes. Considering all of Rishi's passions, he believes she'd better fit to be his apprentice, rather than the Empress. However, Rishi declines because she's here to marry Prince Arnold, a name that sparks interest in Michelle. He loves both Arnold turning down Kyle's request and his reasoning for it. The beastly prince is perfect for the compound he's called Black Powder, a compound which shakes Rishi to her core. She tries to dissuade Michelle, saying Arnold is actually a very kind person. However, Michelle cuts her off, asking Rishi to help him meet Arnold. He wants to meet him now. Rishi keeps making excuses, causing Michelle to catch on. The truth is, she doesn't want him to meet with Arnold. But how could she know what black powder is if he hasn't explained it yet? Well, back in her third life, Rishi already pleaded for Michelle to stop his experiments, as they would lead to the loss of many lives. Michelle brought up the phrase, what humans create must be used the right way. 
he always felt the biggest problem with this being no one can accurately define what the right way is. If it truly did bring the world to its end, he felt it wouldn't be wrong for him to want to see it. This philosophy is what caused him and Rishé to part ways. In the halls, Rishé contemplates on finding a way to establish friendly relations between Coriolis and Gaokine, and how to prevent Michelle from meeting with her prince. Then suddenly a hand grabs her, making an audible sound from the skin clapping together. It's Theodore, holding a serious look on his face. He heard Arnold found out about Rishé dressing as a boy, but he's fine with it. He learned because he has ears all over the place, due to his information gathering retainers. Upon hearing how good these retainers are, Rishé asks to borrow them, and when hearing these retainers will be used to rebel against Arnold, Theodore gets excited and decides to help her. Outside, Michel goes for his usual smoke session, remembering at his mother's grave that his father blamed her death on him being born, telling him to atone as he was a curse that brought misfortune to their entire family. Despite his days being miserable, he always excelled in learning. Learning was equivalent to breathing or drinking water. Eventually, he was allowed into an experiment laboratory where his world expanded. If he wanted to learn something and he experimented, his efforts always paid off. A war eventually broke out where he lived, and all the alchemists' laboratories, everyone, including his father, died. He eventually found a compound capable of destroying everything, a black explosive powder. He felt just as his father has said, he'd been born to bring misfortune to others. Rishé meets with him, asking if he really intends to give Arnold the black powder, to which Michel replies, everything born in this world must fulfill its purpose. He felt he himself born to upset the ways of the world, must fulfill his own place. It's just the same as he had said to Rishé in her third life. But if things keep going this way, she won't have a way to stop him. Will Dr. Michel lead Arnold towards a path of destruction? Find out next week by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. For now though, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one. In order to avoid a future where Coriolis is destroyed, Rishé formed an alliance with Prince Kyle. However, Professor Michel's aim is to find out how large an effect black powder will have on this world. To that end, she's certain Michel will point out black powder's power to Prince Arnold, so she must find a way to stop the professor's experiment, no matter what it takes. However, she suddenly gets pulled out by the beautiful Leto fireflies brimming amongst the night. One even sits in her hand, but flies over to the balcony where she notices Prince Arnold. The two stare at each other with a bit of silence. Arnold didn't know what these fireflies were apparently, but if Rishé wanted them exterminated, he'd give the order. This makes Rishé freak out. She doesn't want him to thoughtlessly exterminate them. All animals, humans included, are part of one large cycle as she sees it. Besides, she finds them beautiful. However, with the wind blowing, Arnold can't help but feel Rishé is the beautiful one. Rishé finds it strange that they all seem to fly towards Arnold. Well, since that's the case, he suggests she come over to him. So she does the most Rishé thing and leaps over from her balcony to him. As he catches her, she apologizes for startling him and blushing in his arms, assures her prince she can jump distances like that with no problem. Well, he already knew that. After all, she jumped down to the ground from a palace balcony. And even though he knew he moved reflexively, he couldn't help it. And hearing this only intensifies her blushing feelings. The wind gives a soft breeze amongst the two, as if there's no one else but them in this world. Rishé then goes to pick up his sword, handing it back to Arnold. He then makes her aware she could have just gone through the door, and for some reason this shocks her as if the thought never even crossed her mind. Rishé then asks why Arnold has his sword with him, and he apparently brought it because he mistook the fireflies for torches. This makes Rishé realize the lights kind of resemble torches on a battlefield. Just looking at Arnold, she can tell memories of war are vividly embedded within him. Then, when a firefly passes by his eyes, as if entranced, she remarks how beautiful they are. Arnold turns away, mentioning his eyes are the same color as his father's. They're proof he carries his father's blood in his veins. But, when he was a child, he wanted to gouge both of these eyes out. He doesn't believe she should gaze at them with endearment. Rishé is surprised, but now has a little more perspective on the deep hostility between Prince Arnold and the Emperor. Arnold then recalls when Rishé had first come to this palace. She said she had an admiration for this country. However, he cannot feel that same admiration. To him, 
the fireflies look like the fires of war, and looking down, the view of the capital infuriates him. Maybe it's because of his eyes he inherited from his father, or maybe his innate nature. Rishe then responds by telling him, sure, maybe from far away, the fireflies look like wartime fires, but the values inherent to such a perception aren't inherited from one's parents. They're gained through everything a person has experienced. She believes Arnold just needs to learn. Learn about the beauty of this nation and the magnificent things that live in it. Hearing this, Arnold just scoffs, believing he has no need for such things. As long as there are things he can use to achieve his goals, that's all that matters. He's even killed people dear to him with his own hands. So if Rishe ever became an impediment, he'd discard her too. In regards to Coyolas, he doesn't know what Rishe might be thinking, but he coldly warns her to not do anything that would force him to be rid of her. Rishe doesn't back down, however. Becoming his wife, she still has things she wants to achieve with her own aims, even if he casts her aside. However, when that happens, she'll simply return here again. Hearing that, Arnold replies, What? So she explains that even if he casts her aside, declare their engagement broken, she'll interview to become a maid and return to this palace. If that doesn't work, she'll dress as a man and become a knight. And if that doesn't work, she'll come as an herbalist. She'd acquire whatever skills seem like they let her slip back into the palace. And when back in, she'd come to see him again and again. Rishe smiles, telling Arnold not to worry, because she won't stand by and let him get rid of her, which definitely surprises him. She touches his face and says, To me, these eyes are your eyes, Prince Arnold, even if you detest them. I want to tell you this over and over again. I think your eyes are the most beautiful in all the world. Arnold softens a bit, telling her it's late and she should go rest, and the two call it a night. The following day comes with one of Theodore's men tailing Michel as he wanders the market. Riche is busy as ever, planning things out with Theodore, and later she receives the finely powdered medals she requested from Prince Kyle. Kyle then mentions he's managed to obtain an appointment to speak with Arnold one more time, but wonders if he really can convince him. Riche isn't entirely sure, but is at least confident that what they're presenting him will at least entice Arnold to listen. She's certain because she's Prince Arnold's future wife, and later that night, she goes to work on the powdered metals. As the intelligence continues to tell Michelle, it seems Michelle was wary, having the man trip over a bottle that releases gas to knock the man out. The two princes sit across from each other, with Arnold right out of the gate, telling him he still feels no value in an alliance with Coyolas. So, he assumes they brought something as a worthwhile proposal. Before Riche takes her seat, she asks Arnold how she differs from her usual self today. He looks at her and mentions the earrings, bracelet, and necklaces, none of which are familiar to him. It's just as he says, all these pieces of jewelry are made from Coyolas. With the nation being snowed in half the year, they advance the craft of jewelry making indoors. Even the most attentive crafts can be done exquisitely by Coyola's artisans. Kyle proudly hangs that as his nation's treasure. Riche then presents Arnold's watch to him. But wait, that's not his watch. It's a duplicate, created by a jeweler from Coyola's. And now artisans from Coyola's can both repair and reproduce more. Watches are a rarity in this world. So what about a nation that could produce watches in large scale? Perhaps technology that could use both gears and clockwork. Carriages that can move even without horses. Ships that can sail even without wind. In the not so far future, the only country with the skills to make those dreams a reality would be Coyolas. Riche is banking on the idea that Arnold would want those things to advance the technical prowess of Gaokine, but it seems to be not enough for Arnold. He acknowledges Coyolas' skills are exceptional, even possessing things his own nation lacks. However, he finds this naivety revolting. There's no need to form an alliance to obtain another country's technology, because everything can be taken by military force. To this though, Kyle answers strongly. Riche believes Arnold truly wants to make this world a more wonderful place. Kyle respects Arnold as an outstanding leader, acknowledging that during the war, Arnold even showed enemy nations respect. Kyle will spare nothing to form an alliance with Arnold. But then, a knock on the door, and Oliver enters, presenting Prince Theodore. He winks at Riche, signaling an emergency so they take their leave. And in the halls, Theodore tells Riche that everyone shadowing Michelle was given the slip, explaining the man who was knocked out in the alleyway 
However, things are not over in the meeting room, with Arnold calling his guards in, to Kyle's surprise. Back with Theodore, he thought it was strange that when he barged in, how his brother Arnold didn't seem surprised at all, and it seems they found Michelle. He's been at the palace all along. The knights tell Riche to stand back because this man has declared he will cause an act of violence in town at 6 this evening. Michelle knows by doing this, Arnold will hear about the effectiveness of black powder. He knows it'll kill many people, but he must take responsibility for its creation. It's of great importance to him. He tells Riche his words shouldn't be taken at face value. Taking her as his student was no more than a whim of his. Then Theodore comes in giving the okay, and Riche remembers asking him once if it was impossible for poison to bring someone happiness, but now she She's certain it's possible. Her alchemy teacher once told her, if one fails to take all variables into account, the experiment will fail. No matter how great of an alchemist you are, your results will not always be as you anticipated. This is because Michelle didn't count on the variable that Riche is. Seeing the time hit 6, Michelle's black powder lights, but not what he was expecting. It becomes a firework. Something that even Arnold smiles over. Michelle's confused over the colored black powder that's exploded in the sky. Riche explains she once looked for a way to differentiate colored metals. At that time, someone showed her a beautiful aurora. When fire is applied to metal, it gives off a beautiful light. However, she also obtained a method to change the colors of a flame. She believes there's nothing which exists solely to bring misfortune to others. Michelle is shocked she plotted all of this just to make him understand that. Well, that's our Riche. She just needed evidence to prove her point. With the fireworks continuing to burst, it's something that was beyond his imagination. All of Galkind stared and marveled at its beauty. Michelle surprised something coming from him could be so beautiful. Riche had Theodore's retainers gather all of Michelle's black powder throughout the city, due to the knowledge she had in her third life. Count Lawvine suddenly enters, saying he'll be taking Michelle in, even against Theodore's orders. However, Arnold then comes and with Riche about to explain, Arnold tells her there's no need. He announces it to be no more than a scholar of Coyola's demonstrating a new technology, and that he intends to form a technological partnership with Coyola's. Hearing this really gets Riche smiling. Prince Kyle then joins in, and Arnold explains that in exchange for providing military instruction to Coyola's, Galkine will be borrowing their precision machining techniques and academic knowledge. He believes those flowers of flame he saw earlier are proof Coyolas possesses technologies unknown to his own empire. And with that, Lavine yields. Prince Kyle scolds Michelle for causing such a huge commotion, trying to unveil his research. However, as Michelle is trying to explain he was going to kill people, Riche stops him, telling Michelle to just let Kyle be angry. With this, Michelle gives a face full of remorse, knowing his thought process was truly flawed, and he promises to never do this again. Riche then walks up to her prince, where he tells her he is not helping Coyolas out of kindness. He knows Michelle was plotting something unsavory, but if he was charged as a criminal, Arnold's father would hear about it, so he wanted to avoid that. However, if he chooses to kill Michelle in secret, he wants no complaints from Riche. So she comes over to whisper that Michelle was the one who invented the pocket watch, and if they are joining forces with Coyolas, they'll need Michelle's knowledge. Arnold sighs, remarking that no matter how he looks at this, she was confident she could convince him from the very beginning. Riche plays it off saying, how could she be? The only thing she was confident in is that he'd be interested in the professor. And with the people having seen the fireworks, after learning they were from Coyolas, they'd probably want to support the alliance as well. Sometime later, Riche gives Prince Kyle medicine to help with seasickness on his journey home, even though the flavor is as terrible as ever. He's fine with it since it's still better than being seasick. He thanks Riche for helping him in the alliance with Arnold. However, Riche credits Coyolas and their technologies. Meeting with Michel, he believes Arnold to be far too magnanimous, but Riche assures him he isn't, as he needs Michel to continue producing the best results in their joint venture. She thinks of this as a severe punishment which the average person wouldn't be able to handle. Michel has been given the objective to create things which will make the world more wonderful. He's never done research like that before, but he'll do his best. He then apologizes for saying Riche wasn't suited to be an empress. She's more suited than he thought, but wonders if she'll regret not coming along as his student. She replies that, right now, what she wants to know about is the man who will become her husband. She wants to know him more than any research result or theory. And with that, Michelle leaves, still calling her his student. 
In Arnold's office, Riche retells Michelle's remarks of Prince Arnold being too magnanimous. However, Arnold just answers plainly that they'll make good use of him. Riche then thanks Arnold and gives a certain look. Taking a deep breath, she has one more thing to report. Her ring is finished. She wanted to see the result with Arnold, so she hasn't opened it yet. But when he tells her seeing that ring is unnecessary for him, she gets a little saddened. He told her though, the only thing he requested was that she allow him to give her a ring because he feels he has no right to wish for more than that. Hearing that surprises Riche. She then tells him, no, she had it sized for her third finger on her left hand. In her country, the husband places a ring on the wife's third finger. She longed to experience that sort of ritual. She wants to wear this ring for the wedding ceremony and she'll choose a dress to match it. Even with Arnold saying it's unnecessary, she's going to wear this ring everywhere. So she wants Arnold to put this ring on her finger. She wants it now. She even pleads with her prince for this. Arnold gives his usual sigh. Complying with her wishes, he sits her down. Getting on one knee, he gives her a light kiss on her hand, uttering her name, making her blush. He opens the ring case and tells her not to hold her breath, but she isn't. She simply forgot how to breathe, making him chuckle a little. She closes her eyes as the ring slides on, and with her gasping, Arnold teases her, asking if she's remembered how to breathe. With that, she looks at the beautiful stone with the color of her prince's eyes. Wearing this ring makes her feel like she can accomplish anything, and looking at it puts Arnold in a better mood than he imagined, which certainly makes Riche happy. Riche then tells Arnold she wants to go on a journey with him, to see all of the beautiful things in this world. Not just fireflies and fireworks, she wants to find many more things he thinks are lovely and beautiful. He smoothly replies, thanks to her, he's found one more of those things. Referring to the ring on her finger, she can't figure that out for some reason, so he pats her on the head, saying he's sure she will one day. And with the happy couple smiling, Riche hopes to see a beautiful future together with Prince Arnold. In this life, it's the great objective she's found for herself. Wow, it's finally over. A nice end, however, I can't help but feel the stakes were a little low and lukewarm. I wanted to see Riche stop Arnold from quite literally killing people. But this is a nice end for now. Subscribe for more content and also watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.